Welcome to the All Metal Mode Podcast with your host, Michael Hare. Tune in every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern with co-host Gypsy Jules, and every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern with Matt Hoffman as we talk to guests, discuss metal detectors, equipment, and everything treasure-related. Feel free to join in the discussion in the chat room during the show. And please, if you like what you hear, we'd appreciate you taking a moment to hit that like button and share the link with your friends. We hope you enjoy the show. The All Metal Mode Podcast starts right now. Noctur Macro Detectors is the fastest growing manufacturer in the industry, and for good reason. Many detectorists, including Mike Hare, call us the most innovative, but we are so much more than that. We listen to and care about our customers. We also offer a wide range of detectors to fit all of your needs. Come check out all of our products today at www.noctadetectors.com. Detectors for everyone, everywhere. A lifetime. Hello, everybody. This is Mike here, and you're listening to the All Metal Mood podcast. Uh, Matt will not be joining us tonight. I, I'm guessing he's got the butt flu again. Um, at least that's what I like to say. Hey, if you're not going to make it, I get to make fun of you, right? If you can't make the show, uh, he's he's just busy, guys. He's really busy. He's got a a, a busy summer. Uh, I did talk to him today. He's pretty sure he can make next week's show, so that's good. Um, don't forget, you can find us on Facebook at All Metal Mode as well as All Metal Mode Podcast UK. All Metal Mode is every Monday and Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and All Metal Mode UK is every Thursday at 8 p.m. GMT or 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're interested in in reading any of my reviews or metal detecting articles, you can find them at allmetalmode.com. The last few, well, my last review and the the next review, you're going to have to read it on uh, online at online. Uh, 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 online at Mac, uh, uh, Dirt Diet. Oh my goodness. Let me back up a second. My next review you can read online at Dirt Digest Magazine. Uh, they are on their second, um, their second, uh, boy, I'm having a rough time here. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, uh, did their second one. They're getting ready to come out here. What we're about 11 days out, I think, until the, the, the next uh, month is out, and um, great, great magazine, DirtDigestMagazine.com. Again, that's DirtDigestMagazine.com. Uh, the current issue features Gypsy Jewels, our very own Gypsy Jewels, and I and I have a review on the Amphibio in it. Um, events, if you know of any events, please let us know. Uh, we'd be more than happy to share your metal detecting event, treasure, civil war, whatever it may be. Um, we'd sure like to hear about it and uh, announce it on the show. Uh, please help us spread the word about the podcast. Please tell your friends and family, anybody who might be interested in listening. We'd really appreciate it. If you have a group or a YouTube channel or whatever, support us and we will support you back. Um, Thursday... Thursday on All Metal Mode UK, we have uh, Mr. Dave Sadler. Um, Dave and I will have uh, Aaron Cooper on from Deep Tech Detectors, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, That should be a lot of fun. So, uh, Dorian, how you doing? Hey, doing good. All right, good deal. I also want to say, any listeners, uh, don't forget... While we're live, you can get into chat. Look for the chat bubble. It just depends on what kind of phone you're on or your computer. Um, you'll find a little chat bubble. And if you have questions for myself or 
um, Dorian or any of our guests when we're on. It's and and it's a great way to to let us know. And also, we usually have some people in chat um, discussing different things and having a good old time. So uh, it's always fun to jump in chat if you can. Um, before we get started, Dorian, boy, did I mess that up really good? Did I fumble through that pretty well or what? Jeez. <laughs> I thought your I thought your recovery was pretty good, Mike. Yeah, you, I made it. it. I made it. You know, I always tell people I I I don't do this because I have a good voice. I do this because I love the hobby. I mean, you sure I sure don't have listeners because of my voice. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> or, or my my skills uh, at uh, talking. So, uh, um, before we get started, tell us about your books and how they can get them, Dorian. Well. Um, the books are, are um, it's a little bit wild because I don't have them. I have not been part of them yet. They're not online. You know, it's not a simple matter. Hey, D- Dorian, you're you're real muffled, buddy. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I think we might have lost Dorian. Uh, are you still with us? Hang on. Okay. Are you there? Yeah, we're having some issues, though. You're breaking up real bad. Hey, Dorian. If... Okay. There he came back. Let's see if that helps the connection. Yeah, there you go. Now you sound good. Like I'm going to go out on the front porch. It'll, uh, <laughs> I'm going down while I'm talking. I, I didn't, I'm not catching much of what you're saying. All right. Hang on. Hang on. 30 uh, seconds. Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. You do, you, you do you. We'll get this. Okay. <laughs> 30 seconds. All right. Yeah. Hey, it's worth it. I don't care if he's garbled. We'll, We'll we'll wait it out because uh, Dorian is uh, just amazing. So well, it's nice to see you guys in chat. When I when I started the show, we didn't have anybody in chat, and I thought, well, where's everybody at? Glad to see you guys make it. Um, Bill, always a pleasure. Leroy, uh, can't say I've ever seen you, but in but really happy to see you see you in. And uh, let's see who else we got. Steve Adams, hey buddy, how you doing? And uh, yeah, Dorian's garbled. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> nah, hopefully, we'll get we'll get get it fixed here. He, it, it's funny. We've been talking for the last fifteen minutes, no issues. We go live, and all of a sudden, we have problems. So, everybody, just hang in there a minute. We'll get we'll get to it. Hopefully, maybe. Okay, while we're waiting on that, let's see. What can we talk about? I didn't have anything ready. Um, I don't know. How's everybody's week been? Let's talk about that. It's getting hot here in Texas. Boy, is it getting hot. Um, if, you there, if, Mike? If you missed... Yeah, I, I am. If you Real quick, if you missed last night's show, we had a lot of fun. We had Steph... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher Tangeray on um she's up in uh I, th- I believe connecticut wow does she make some nice finds and uh she was a lot of fun to have on yeah dorian can how's how, how's it going now uh almost there oh uh, uh, you're I'm outside hooking into an extension cord here on my phone charger hang on a second you're you're sounding so much better now i dorian i don't know what happened uh, we talked what fifteen minutes before the show, and um, yeah, you know, We've, sound uh, agree- A lot of us up here have been having uh, phone reception problems, uh, signal coming and going, last few days. Huh. That is weird. So it's uh, one of the negatives we fight here in the Appalachians. Yeah, worth uh, it though. I'll worth put, it, isn't? It? I'll put up with. Yeah, I'll put up with it for the beauty we have here. It's gorgeous. Absolutely. Okay, I'm about to reset up here. Okay, good deal. 
Good deal. But yeah, if you missed last night's show, uh, highly recommend it. We had a lot of fun. You, Gypsy really came out of her. She had a, she did so good. I, I pretty much just uh, let the ladies talk, and uh, I thought Gypsy done a wonderful job. Had some great questions, and they had great chemistry, and uh, they they really pulled off a good show. Um, so it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Bill says Fossick Dig is coming up soon. Check it out here, BuckeyeGold.com. Good deal. Thank you so much, Bill. Tonight, as okay, many I'm of you, all ready. oh right, as many of you know, this might be a little controversial, um, but we're doing it. I, hey, all metal mode isn't afraid of uh, a little controversy and uh it's all about learning and uh boy is dorian a teacher dorian before we get started we didn't catch any of that about your books uh can you go um can you run us through your books and how to get a hold of them uh the best thing to do uh right now at the present time anybody that just you know, wants them really quickly here um you're going to have to uh buy them directly from me uh, you can uh, email me at my email address, and this is lowercase letters, D-C-L-A at earthlink.net. Are we still there? Hello? Yeah, what's the name of your books? I'm sorry, Dorian. Okay. All right, uh, the five books, I have three in a series called Kentucky in the Civil War Years, volumes one, two, and three. One of them is on the uh, biggest Civil War battle in Perry, uh, Kentucky called Perryville. It's one of the 20 biggest battles in the whole Civil War, uh, nearly 10,000 casualties. Fascinating read. Uh, to me, it was at least a fascinating study, I should say, in preparation for writing the book. Uh, the second book was called uh, John Hunt Morgan, uh, terrorist with a rebel heart. John Hunt Morgan, the famous Confederate raider, was called the Thunderbolt of the Confederacy, and he terrorized hundreds of thousands of uh, Union loyal people all over Kentucky and Indiana and Ohio uh, with his raids. Quite a story. And then the third book is called Battle to Battle, and it's about uh, all of the other major battles, not as big as Perryville, but still very significant battles uh, in terms of determining whether or not Kentucky would go with the Union or uh, become one of the Confederate states. It was called a border state. Mm-hmm. Um, the other two books are in a series called uh, Kentucky in the Early Years, and the title of the books are basically Heroes and Hostiles, Volumes 1 and 2. And this is about the pioneer Indian War days from about 1760 to about 1810 or 20. Uh, when the uh, uh, pioneers were desperately besieged. At one time, there were only 127 uh, settlers left in Kentucky uh, against over 33,500 Indians, and yet they held their ground and survived. And it's a fascinating read. Uh, I went through and I picked out the more unusual stories about that period. Uh, uh, For example, um, about the time Simon Kenton saved Daniel Boone's life. Very few people know about that. And, and, uh, you know, it's just just a lot of neat stuff uh, of that period that most of our people are pretty much ignorant on. Uh, It was quite a struggle, Uh, quite a struggle. Uh, There were thousands and killed on both sides. Uh, In fact, they don't even know the exact number. But at the peak of the conflict, they reported that 70... Uh, bodies of murdered settlers were seen floating down the Ohio River every day. Wow. Um, so, anyway, that gives, gives you an idea of the subjects. Here's and what if I'm... anybody would like, if you if, if anybody that email, emails me if you'd like a sample chapter out of one of the books, you know, just tell me which book you're interested in, and I'll send you a, one of the chapters in the book to read. I can tell you guys these are great reads. Now, I'm only in my first book. Um, incredible, incredible. Um, it's, it's really hard for me to get time to read around here with these kids, but, um, I'm pretty far into it now. And I'll tell you what it is. It is aggravating 
to get it. It's one of those books. If I didn't have kids, I would read it 10, 12 hours straight. Uh, you know, the only other time I I've ever been into a book, especially history, because I find history as much as I love history. Most of the, the books you read on history are so dry. Um, they're so boring and Dorian's books. I'm telling you, if it wasn't for the kids, I would have, I'd read a book a day. I, I guarantee it. It's it. You know, if you've ever read um, the Frontiersman, Dark and Bloody River by Alan Eckert, uh, I got to say my favorite writer. Man, that, could that guy tell a story? Dorian's books are in that that kind of category. You don't you, you don't put it down unless you just have to. It's they're great reads. Highly recommend them. Uh, thank you, Bill, so much. D C L A at Earthlink. Dot net. Of course, if anybody's interested, you can uh, get a hold of Dorian. Dorian's on Facebook. Are you okay with answering questions through Facebook, Dorian? Uh, sure, I am. Uh, Facebook yeah. Messenger's okay. And, yeah, yeah. Dorian, Dorian Cook. Um, he's on Facebook. And uh, why we're on it, real quick. Uh, we're not going to go on it. Uh, it. Your book needs a lot of pictures for Mike. Yes, Steve, you're right. And he's got a lot of pictures in him jerk <laughs> steve says i need a lot of pictures yeah and they are there's a lot oh, of pictures and yeah. they're interesting it's it's a great read uh yeah. no kidding um good information you, you can tell you the uh, what i do in the, in the book is i use pictures of colonial and civil war reenactors they were actually reenacting those battles and I, I i fit them right into the places in the book where they where they fit in the story mm-hmm. and uh I, it's, my, it's my way of honoring the reenactors because they are fantastic people. If you ever hang around these reenactors, every one of them is a walking, talking, living history book, and they're wonderful people to talk to. Absolutely. And uh, what they do at their own expense is just amazing to me. So I, I wanted to honor them, uh, but I also understand about the pictures. And my book on Perryville, there's, there's probably two dozen books written about the Battle of Perryville, and mine just blows everybody else out of the water when it comes to pictures and my books are full color except where i use a historical picture from the 1800s it was only black and white Mm -hmm. (laughs) so yes full color plenty of pictures and designed to read like adventure fiction Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely great great read uh while we're on it real quick we're going to go ahead and do uh um we dig the civil war headquarters on facebook that's dorian's group i know we talk about it a lot If you have any interest in the Civil War, I'll tell you, it's a really unique group. I've never seen a Facebook group done like it. Um, Real stories, real interaction. You know, I get so tired of going to the groups, and it's like I found a large scent today, and 22 people respond, great job. That's (laughs) That's not what we dig the Civil War headquarters is about. Uh, there's a lot of uh, older guy, or I wouldn't not necessarily older, experienced guys helping the younger people, sharing information, sharing awesome stories. Dor- Dorian posts some amazing stories in there, along with some others. Some others have really stepped it up and told some great stories. So I, I just I love it. Uh, check it out. Um, I'll tell you, you gotta you gotta interact or, or old uh, old general will boot you though. I'm telling you, he'll boot you. Um, but you know, I love what he's doing. You, you know, he's not in no way is he being mean or anything like that. He just, he wants people active. You know, he understands people are busy, things come up, you know, but if he looks through the last month and you haven't even thumbs up anything, he's, he's getting rid of people. And I, I agree with that 100% and like it. My goodness. If you, if you don't have the time to come visit, if you don't have the time to, 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 you know, you're going to read an article and you can't even give a thumbs up or, you know, you don't need to be around. And I love his, his approach. Check it out. Um, tonight, biblical archaeology. This ought to be a lot of fun. I, Dorian, I, I don't, I, I don't have anything. I'm just going to listen to you and, uh, I'm really excited. We've, I've had some people reach out to me who are really excited about it. So, uh, Okay. I'll give the floor uh, to you. Sure. Okay. Uh, you know, it's just like Mike and I were talking. Uh, probably the two most dangerous subjects to 
to try to, to speak on are politics and religion because people have such strong feelings about both and about particular ideas and doctrines associated with both. So, you know, with that understanding, uh, I want to tell everybody, you know, I'm not here to try to make a presentation that has anything to do with getting you to go to church or anything like that. That's not my mission at all. I want to tell you about my own journey that from being a longtime treasure hunter, relic hunter, into actually participating in official uh, biblical archaeological excavations in Israel, um, and also being involved in other ones. We've got one uh, uh, that I'm on the team as the official metal detector consultant uh, that is going to be involved uh, excavations on what we think are the remains of Noah's Ark in Turkey. And uh, that's going to be really exciting. We've done uh, radar, side scan radar uh, images, and we could, we have seen uh, very clear images of, one, of the top deck collapse on this ship, and the second deck is still intact. The rooms are intact, and we're going to try to excavate into them. If we get the approval, the official approval of the Turkish government, and we're very close to having that. So that's just mm-hmm. a little tip up there to, to let you know some of the things you know, that are going on right at this moment. But I'd like to tell you about my journey, yes, uh, how please. I got here. Please, uh, tell us from the beginning. Now, okay, you know, I'm not going to make any, I'm not going to try to dance around the fact that, uh, you know, I do consider myself to be a Christian. So uh, that being said, uh, I'm not very much like what we call a mainstream Christian today because my hunger and quest for truth has taken me in directions that the average Christian never goes. And so um, I've been able to be involved in discoveries of things that I want to share with you because I don't think any of these things are going to damage anybody's faith or belief that already has it. Uh, But, you know, it might give some people who don't know, you know, a lot of people are hostile. They just don't know. They've never seen any proof you know, that the Bible is true or the history of the Bible is true. And I'm going to be talking about basically the Bible as history. But before I get into that, I want to give you just a few little brief passages of Scripture that were the motivators for me to get involved. And then I'll explain to you how Um, I got involved. Real quick before that, if it's okay, Bill asked, how big is the ship approximately? Um according length according to the side scans the ship if you'll pardon me i wasn't prepared for this i i don't have my fact sheet in front of me um the ship fits you understand the uh account of noah's ark was written by uh moses and moses had grown up in egypt as an egyptian general at one time he was in charge of the whole egyptian army So Moses was familiar with a measurement called the Egyptian cubit. And if I recall correctly, that's about 22 inches. And according to the number of cubits that Moses wrote in his report about the ark, uh, this this structure that we found, which is not on Mount Ararat, at least the portion of it that we found was moved uh, on a volcanic lava and mud flow from the mountain, the base of the mountain, down into a valley. It's about two miles from its original location. And the structure has become petrified. The wood has turned to stone. I've held pieces of it in my hands. And, uh, Mike, you know, we talked last time about out of place archaeology. And um, there's definitely that involved in this structure, in this boat shaped structure. Mm. Um, but I can't, I can't give you exact figures on the length. I can get those figures for you. Um, but everything, uh, according to, if we use the Egyptian cubit and we have measured this, walked it, measured it, uh, a lot of work's been done on it. Uh, everything fits the Bible account. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about on a number of other things. I have not personally been to the site yet. Uh, I have been to the private museum uh, that's hidden away in Tennessee where the artifacts that have come off of this that the Turkish government has allowed us to bring back to the States. I've been in that museum. I've held them in my hands. Uh, I've seen the wood. 
There were great surprises. We found iron brackets, iron rivets were used in the ark, big ones. I've held those rivets in my hand. Uh, and a recent discovery in the petrified wood, we have found titanium nails. So we're coming to the conclusion, and laminated wood, by the way. We even have in the petrified wood, we can see where sections of wood were laminated and where the glue seeped out of the wood. Oh, that's interesting. Very much so. So we're coming to the conclusion, by the evidence that we're finding, that the pre-flood world, as it's called, was much farther advanced than we have traditionally believed. Hmm. So there's a little out of place archaeology. Anyway, I'm I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Yep. Um, let let me go back and tell you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Let's start from the beginning. Now. Yep. Got, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, as a young man ran across a, a a passage of scripture that caught my attention. It was in the book of Thessalonians, chapter First Thessalonians, chapter five twenty one, and he said, "Prove all things and hold fast that which is good." And I thought, you know, that sounds like pretty good advice for anybody, whether you're religious or not. You know, prove means to test. You know, imagine if you went into a car dealership, and there's this beautiful Corvette with about 27 clear coats over your favorite color, and it's at a bargain price. And uh, you look at it, you know, and you, and, you, and you climb in, you start the engine, the engine's just purring away, and you look at the salesman and say, I'll take it. And the deal's done, you pay your money, you drive off the lot, and you get about a block, and the transmission falls out of it. Right, no good. You know, and, and the salesman says, sorry, you know, it says right here on the, on the tag, you know, sold as is. Well, see, the problem was, you didn't prove it out. You didn't take it for a test drive first. So, you know, basically what that, what that, that particular scripture telling us is, test things. You don't, don't be a sucker for everything that comes along. You know, but check it out and see if it's if really a bargain, if it's really true, if it's really, you know, something you want. And it says, you know, if it proves out, then it says hold fast, that which is good. You know, I mean, if the car's in great shape and you get a bargain, then keep it, you know, buy it and keep it and drive it. Great, you know, <laughs> but but find out if it's in good shape first. You know, that's the principle that we're being taught. And I thought, I thought that was a good one. So I've tried to, to live my life by that. But another very important one, it's, it's repeated actually in two places in the Gospels, as they're called, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Well, that's a pretty blunt, direct uh, scripture. It, you know, it doesn't say, uh, but there's 37 quali- qualifications, you know, you have to, or 37 hoops you have to jump through first. It doesn't say anything like that. It just says, ask, and it shall be given you, seek, and you shall find. And then in, in Luke 11, 9, he says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. And this is, you know, supposedly the word spoken by Jesus Christ. And he says, ask, it shall be given you, seek, and you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And then he says, for everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and the hand that knocks, it shall be opened. Well, I I was intrigued by that as a young man, and so it was planted firmly in my mind. And back in the uh, 90s, early 90s, uh, one of the friends sent me a copy of a video they'd seen on television. And in this video, this man and his wife were claiming to be in the ruins of the, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and that... Uh, uh, they were showing things that really amazed me. It looked like uh, the shapes of buildings and things, and yet they didn't look like, you know, ruins of a of a destroyed city, of a stone city or anything. It looked very different from any ruins I'd ever seen. And yet they showed that there were burned balls or partially burned balls of sulfur scattered throughout these ruins. And that intrigued me because they quoted the scriptures about, you know, the destruction of these so-called cities of the plain uh, that were positioned around the Dead Sea in Israel. And at the time that this happened, apparently this was a very fertile valley. It's now a desert. Only rains about once every five to seven years there. Uh, but anyway, I was intrigued, and I, I thought, well, this is pretty compelling. It looks like this guy's got some serious evidence, visual evidence of an event talked about in the Bible. And, you know, one of the things that always bothered me about uh, standard 
Christianity uh, and a lot of the churches was, I heard many preachers say, you have to accept this on blind faith. In other words, that you don't, you know, you can not allow any proof. You just have to accept that what we're saying is true. Well, that that's never set well with me, and I've never been able to really get into that. Um, but I thought, man, I would really like to. Um, I really like to go. I'd like to go over there and see those ruins. I've never been overseas. Um, well, I'll take that back. I, I did. Uh, I did go with a church group for uh, to Jerusalem back in 1984 for a tour. But uh, it certainly wasn't even thinking about doing any archaeological work, although we did visit some archaeological ruins back then. But now I want to know, you know, has this guy actually found the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, and, and, and will, will these ruins actually uh, verify, you know, the historical account of the destruction of what was called the five cities of the plain? See, there were actually five cities that were destroyed, supposedly, by having burning sulfur rains on them. And that was Sodom, Gomorrah, Edna, uh, Zeboam, and Zoar, the five cities. So I thought about that system that says, knock it to the open key, speak, and you shall find. And I'd come across another one by this time in Luke. It said in Luke 12, too, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. And I said, okay. So I kind of took God as a, ch- a challenge, and I said, I knocked. And I said, I want to go over there, and I want to see for myself, is this guy some kind of a phony, you know, that's, that's, that's pitching something, trying to raise money for his church or whatever? Or is this actually true? Well, I, when you knock at somebody's door, you don't then just grab the handle and walk in. You wait until they answer the door, don't you, and open it. Okay, I waited, I waited, and I waited, and the years started rolling by, and there wasn't any open door for me to walk through, and eight long years rolled by, and the man who claimed to have found these ruins was a a Seventh-day Adventist Bible archaeologist named Ron Wyatt, and some of you are probably familiar with his... uh, uh, story. Uh, if you're not, you can go to ronwyatt.com and uh, his, uh, he is now deceased, but his family maintains a lot of his material and stuff on that site that you can uh, check out. Well, anyway, Ron Wyatt got colon cancer and he died eight years into my quest. And uh, two more years went by now, and I thought, well, I guess, you know, I knocked and, and the man upstairs said no. I guess I'm not going. And then I had to make a trip down uh, to northern Alabama, and we have to be going through a little town called Cornersville, Tennessee, below Nashville. And Ron Wyatt, before he died, had, had taken a bought an old service station, turned it into a museum of some of the artifacts and things he'd found. Uh, he supposedly had discovered uh, not only Sodom and Gomorrah, but discovered these remains of Noah's Ark that I was talking about. Uh, had discovered the Red Sea crossing site where the Israelites crossed, uh, uh, like we saw in the, in the Ten Commandments movie that everybody's seen, I think. And some other things, you know, and it seemed too incredible that, that one man could have discovered all this and that, you know, they actually existed. But again, if I let my opinion say this can't be possible, then I'm really not a truth seeker anymore. I'm an opinionated person. I've just expressed opinion that I can't prove to you by fact. I'm just saying, well, it doesn't sound likely. You know, okay, maybe it doesn't sound likely, or that's not logical. Uh, All of those are statements that are enemies to people who seek truth. Uh, the, The thing is, okay, I'm skeptical, but I'm not going to dismiss this until I get more evidence one way or the other. That's, I think, a better approach to take. For sure. Okay, so uh, we thought, my wife and I thought, well, we'll stop at this little museum, you know, and see what's in there. And uh, we did stop in, and we met the uh, man who had taken over uh, uh, Ron White and established an organization called White Archaeology. And after he passed, one of his close friends that had worked with him became the uh, chairman of the board, and he took over 
running the museum and uh, whatever work that they were going to continue to do. His name was Richard Reeves. And uh, I met Richard and uh, his family. We hit it off really nice. So Richard and I were in the museum having a great conversation. Uh, talking about various things, and I was seeing some of the uh, artifacts that were on display there at the time. Um, and, uh, I just happened to mention something that I've been researching. Uh, in the hey, Dorian, we're we're having some yes. issues again. Are you there on the phone? Yeah, yeah. It's not as bad as before, but you're cutting out a little bit. Okay. Any yeah. better? I, I let's give it a try. Okay. All right. I'm a lot open spaces here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're five miles from the cell phone tower. It's the best I can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Let me let me get my thought together here. Yeah. Okay. So we're having this conversation, and I've been doing some. Uh, Work on tracing, uh, you know, the the Israelites, uh, the nation of Israel in the Bible times was composed of twelve different tribes, and uh, people a lot of think, you know, they think, well, you know, the Jews, they think that word covers all twelve tribes, and it does not, because the Jews were descendants of the tribe of Judah, and they're only one tribe; they're not all twelve. And uh, these twi- these twelve tribes had the same father, but they had four different mothers. Hmm. So that makes the different tribes, the people descended from those tribes, they don't all look alike. They have certain characteristics they got from their four mothers. Uh, the ones that have the same father and mother, you know, do have some resemblances, but the ones who have different mothers, they have different hair colors and looks. And so uh, what happened in Israel was that God told them, don't, uh, don't go inquire about how these other heathen nations around you serve their gods. And Israel did exactly that. Whatever God said they'll do, they went and did. And so they ended up, uh, got so bad, they incorporated so much of the uh, pagan religions, even down to they worshipped a god called Molech that was in the shape of an owl, and they would take their firstborn sons and they would they would literally throw them into a big burning bowl that sat on Molech's, at the base of, of Molech's statue, and they would sacrifice their firstborn children by burning them alive. And when it got to this point, literally, the Bible says that God removed them out of their land. The first 10 of the 12 tribes, and he left the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin in the land. And as the years went by, Benjamin and Judah did as bad as the 10 tribes had, and they eventually got booted out of their land and sent into exile. And it is possible to trace where these 12 tribes went after they left Israel. And you can track their descendants to about every nation on earth. Uh, Scotland Island are full of them. The United States is full of their descendants. Uh, this was an amazing, amazing thing. Um, so anyway, getting back to um, what I was looking for here on the Psalm of Gomorrah, um, we know that Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says, were destroyed for what the Bible called wickedness, uh, sin. And, you know, there can be debate over what those sins were. Um, if the, the, most Christians commonly believe they were related to sexual sins. Um, and what I want to address is not that particular part of it, but what the ruins tell us. Um, so... Richard and I were having this conversation, and, and I uh, was telling him a little bit about my research on where the tribes had gone after they were ran out of Israel, and it happened to be something he was very sensitive about, and he got very angry, and we had uh, quite a confrontation, and uh, it took several minutes to calm him down, and I, I managed to change the subject, and I thought, well, okay, you know, I, I didn't want to do this. I pushed his hot button, and I wasn't trying to. So I told him, I said, well, I'll, I'll round up, Linda. I guess we better be heading back for home. And he said, no. He says, don't go. He says, we'll go out. There's a good buffet down the road, and we'll come back to the house and fellowship. So 
we did, and we had a great time. And I thought, oh, okay, we're over the hump here, you know, and we're going to be able to repair this relationship. And we came back and, and, and you know, got uh, comfortable in his big living room. And I thought, boy, this is going to be great. We're going to have a good, you know, uh, a great evening talking about biblical archaeology and Ron Wyatt's work. And instead, Richard likes him to be uh, about this subject that he had gotten so angry about. And right in front of my wife and his wife and his two teenage sons. And boy, he's, he's really dressing me down pretty hard. And uh, we have a saying in Kentucky that you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And uh, he got hit with scripture after scripture. He didn't even know we're in the Bible. <laughs> and I had him ducking and running for cover, and I humiliated the man right in front of his wife and teenage sons. And I'm feeling really, really bad about this. Uh, because this is not what I wanted at all. This, this thing is going the exact opposite direction. You know, obviously, you know, this is not going to help me ever do any work or do any further investigation with Wyatt Archaeology. And uh, I looked over at his wife and kids, all worried about what I was doing to their, you know, their husband and father right in front of them, and they had smiles on their ear their faces from ear to ear. They were actually enjoying it. So... <laughs> That, that was uh, somewhat of a surprise, but that's what happened. And so I gathered up Linda, and uh, we made our good nights, and, and we left and headed back to Kentucky. And I told Linda, I said, well, I said, I guess uh, that takes care of that as far as ever, uh, you know, having a door open there. And two weeks later, I get an email from Richard Reeves, and he's inviting me to participate in a, an official archaeological dig at the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem to reopen Ron Wyatt's diggings there when he was actually looking for the Ark of the Covenant. So you could have knocked me over with a feather. Right. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, it, it was amazing to me. And uh, there was the open door that I'd been asking for, and I had to wait 10 years for it. <laughs> and... Uh, I had a problem, you know, uh, we had to pay our own way. Everybody was a volunteer. There was going to be 65 volunteers on the team and we would be under the, uh, uh, authority of an Israeli archeologist, uh, that worked with the Israeli antiquities authority. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I, at that time I had my landscape business going and a strange thing began to happen. Uh, that was the invitation came in the spring and we were heading over in August and I suddenly, I started to make, and I can't explain it to this day, but I started making a much higher profit margin on my jobs without raising my prices. And mm. I, like I said, I can't, I can't give you a logical explanation, but I, I can tell you this. Uh, Linda and I needed nearly $6,000 to go over above and beyond our regular budget, you know, our household budget and stuff. And by the time uh, one week came before we were scheduled to leave in August, I had that money in hand. Mm. And uh, so we got to go over without having to bust our budget or, you know, uh, sell off the uh, the extra car or anything like that or take out a second mortgage. Uh, we went over on that money, and uh, everything went super well for us. Uh, it's kind of funny. People were telling us, oh, you're going to go over there, and they're going to kidnap you, and they're going to cut off your head, and they're going to do this, and they're going to do that. And, you know, a funny thing, Mike, we were in Israel for three weeks on that dig, and there were more violent deaths in Cincinnati, Ohio, in three weeks than there was in the whole nation of Israel in those three weeks. Wow. How incredible uh, is they that? Have, I, I, I got to tell you, I feel safer on the streets of Jerusalem than any other big city in the world. They have a two-minute response time to any incident, and the Army and the police work together, and they drive around with their blue lights flashing all the time. They never turn them off. They want you to know they're there. Mm. And uh, their security is absolutely second to none in the city. Mm. And uh, if you stop and think about it, you have not heard of an American kidnapped or killed it in Israel, in Jerusalem especially, in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Not a single one. Um, Dorian, I know you got a sense of humor, so I got I to gotta pause you and say this. You know, Bill, Bill is our resident comedian, and, and when you were talking about uh, all of a sudden, you, you know, your your profit margins rose. He said, in other words, he raised the deck height on his mowers. I thought that was funny. Of course, he only meant that as a joke, but uh, 
I had to share yeah, that with you. you. <laughs> <laughs> and by, by the way, uh, I'm going to have to get on about this. Everybody thinks when I say landscaping that I mowed grass. I did not mow grass, people. <laughs> I was a landscape construction specialist, a landscape architect. I designed fancy gardens, oriental gardens, all kinds of stuff, and installed them for the rich people. <laughs> I right. don't, don't get me wrong. As a young man getting started out, I mowed many, many square miles of grass. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everybody thinks a landscaper is somebody that mows grass. No, that's a grounds maintenance in, uh the the term is grounds maintenance, not landscaping. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Greg Weems uh, commented, "Israel doesn't mess around." There's no doubt about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the uh, the soldiers are interesting to talk to one. Uh, in the critical areas, they put the older soldiers, and in the less critical, they have the younger ones. Mm-hmm. And these old soldiers, every one of them speaks perfect English. And they are friendly, and you can talk to them. But the whole time you're talking to them, their eyes are going right and left. They're watching everything around you for any sign of something unusual. Hmm. You know, very impressive. These guys look like they could bite off a piece of rebar and spit ten penny nails. They're, they're tough. <laughs> they are tough looking. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, anyway, um, you know, we had. Uh, uh, and here I have to I have to get in. I have to tell you how things work. You know the problem we have with biblical archaeology. Two big problems. Number one, most of the people who are claimed to be biblical archaeologists are either atheists or agnostic. They are not Christians. Their goal is not to prove the Bible accurate; it's to disprove it. Even the ones who publish magazines like Biblical Archaeology. Um, Another problem is we have an, an element, and let me just say an element, and this is not, you know, I don't want anybody screaming, you're anti-Semitic. I am not. To be Semitic means to be a descendant of, of the son of Shem, or the, of Shem, one of Noah's sons, and I am descended from Shem, so I cannot be anti-Semitic, okay? <laughs> but the point is, anytime, if you offer any criticism for the way they do things, you're automatically, they, they try to make turn it into an attack on their religion, and it's not. But there is an element in that religion that do not does not want any archaeology to be made public that would verify the existence of Jesus Christ and any of the events that are written about, about him in the Scripture. So you definitely have opposition on any project that uh, you try to do and there are elements within the Israeli government involved in this also. Hmm. We were given, we were sent, before we left the States, a form that was an anti-disclosure or a non-disclosure form. We had to sign it and turn it in to the archaeologist leading the uh, dig when we arrived in Israel. And it basically it said that we would not reveal uh, any information about what we saw or what we discovered during this dig. They wanted total control of all information. And in fact, uh, now many years down the road, that they have covered up some incredible projects, incredible finds over there. And uh, when it comes to uh, me and them, I'm standing on that scripture that says, all things which are hidden shall be revealed. But what we did, or what I did, when I got our our, uh, non-disclosure agreements by email, I actually changed them. I went into the middle of the document, which was about a page long, and I inserted the statement for my wife and myself and my son-in-law that went with us. It said, I reserve the right to hold any part of or all of this document null and void if it conflicts with my religious beliefs. <laughs> so that was, what, that was what we signed. And my wife says, well, what if they catch us? And I said, then we won't work on the dig. We'll just tour Jerusalem. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So they never looked to see if we'd altered the document. They just made sure we'd signed it. So that (laughs) left me free. Uh, If I had not done that, I couldn't be talking to you about what I'm going to tell you. (laughs) See, I I would be in legal. I would be in legal trouble if I if I tried to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Okay. What had happened was. At the Garden Tomb, um, the Garden Tomb is about the one so-called Christian site you can find over there that isn't owned by the Catholic Church. 
It's owned by the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Uh, and um, they say that the tomb that is there, uh, it's carved in the rock, could have been the tomb where Jesus was laid after his crucifixion. Uh, but they're not saying that it is. But one, one thing, if they say that it is, the Israeli government would probably shut them down. Hmm. So the best they can do is say it's possible it could have been. Well, anyway, um, back in the um, 70s, uh, Ron Wyatt was walking along uh, the face of what they call the Calvary Escarpment. Uh, the, the vertical cliff there on uh, three sides uh, that forms the Calvary Escarpment was made by a quarrying operation a couple thousand years ago. They quarried out about 60 feet of rock out of Mount Moriah. Imagine a long ridge that's about, um, oh, most of a mile wide. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, and the ridge is probably uh, 60, 70 feet above the surrounding territory. And you just cut a big piece out of it, 60 feet deep and about a quarter mile wide. Wow. Well, that's what happened. That's what happened. And uh, that's what formed what's called the skull face at Golgotha. Uh, and if you've seen modern, for those of you that, that are into this, if you've seen the modern pictures of the uh, skull face, they have been damaged by artillery fire in the in the wars, the recent, the modern wars there. And you can go online and you can find pictures of the skull face that were taken back in the 1870s, and it is awesome the difference. It is mm. truly, it looks like a giant skull, uh, you know, in, in the side of the escarpment. So you might want to do that. It's, it's quite an interesting discovery. It was for me anyway. Real real quick uh, here, Dorian, Dorian, let me pause you. There's uh, Greg saying he can't hear anything. Uh, is anybody else having any issues? Greg, well, he can't hear us. Um, let, me, let me see what's going on. Let me pause you because if nobody can hear it. Uh, there, Mike? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'm not I sure. I checked my phone volume. I'm on full. No, I can hear you, so they should be hearing you unless... Uh, uh, Bill, somebody, let me know if, if there's issue. Uh, it sounds great on his end, so Greg's having an issue. Please continue. I apologize, Dorian. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, rather than walking along the cliff, and... Uh, this is the story he tells. He was with an Israeli Antiquities Authority official, and suddenly Ron's arm flew out. His left arm flew up and pointed towards the cliff face, and he said, that's Jeremiah's Grotto and the Ark of the Covenant's in there. And he said he had no idea why he said that. Hmm. He said he wasn't, even thinking about, he wasn't even thinking about that subject. They were talking about other archaeological projects that he wanted to get a permit to do there in Jerusalem when that happened. And the uh, the antiquities authority man said, "Well, that's great. You know, we'll give you, uh, uh, you know, we'll put you up in the hotel, nearby hotel, and we'll give you a permit to excavate." And uh, that's very unusual in Israel because it usually takes two to five years to get a permit. Wow! So he ended up uh, excavating down the face, and you have to understand uh, the situation in Jerusalem today. The Jerusalem you see today, and the surface you walk on is not anywhere close to the Jerusalem at the time uh, that Christ walked the earth. Uh, at, a, at, at a minimum, you're walking on 40 feet of rubble from a destroyed city, and sometimes as much as 60 or 70 feet of rubble. Because wow. when, the Romans, when the Romans besieged Jerusalem and took it in 79 or 69 AD, they literally destroyed the city. They dismantled it, and it was all stone walls and buildings. And what they did was they just leveled all that rubble and built the new city on top of it. So oh, okay. if you want to go down to what's called the Roman level, you've got to dig down a long ways. And uh, i got to tell you, having been down in this excavation 43 feet below the surface and looking up at the ceiling, and you see giant stones and pieces of pottery and, and all the rubble that comes from a destroyed city, and at any given moment, one of those pieces could fall out of the ceiling and kill you. It was not mm. what we call safe work. We had to do a lot of safety engineering. Uh, the Israeli archaeologists had their safety engineers. 
and we had to shore up and you know uh, put build all kinds of uh, protective uh, works to keep the, to protect the diggers down there. So we had uh, Ron's diggings had been closed since 1989, and we reopened them in 2005. And we found his tools, uh, things that uh, he'd been digging. And Ron had claimed that on January, what he discovered was that inside Golgotha, that is, uh, Golgotha is part uh, of that long, long ridge and um, that the temple mount was part of. Uh, why am I having an old man's moment here? The um, <laughs> the name of the uh, the name of the ridge is very famous. Everybody knows it. Oh, come on! Uh, Abraham took his son there to sacrifice his son in the Bible. Uh, oh, come on! I'm no help. It's I'm also, sorry. It's called Mount. It's called Mount Zion, but it's it's this long ridge. I'm sorry. No, you're uh, you're good. Oh boy! All right, <laughs> I have to. It'll come back. Yeah, to yeah me. it's all right. Uh, anyway, it's the ridge. This ridge runs for a couple, a couple three miles. Uh, it's called a mount, but it's actually a, a ridge. Um, anyway, where Ron dug down, the first thing he found actually carved into the cliff face were these square. Uh, Cutouts. Imagine, you know, you've got a solid limestone wall, and you carve a four by eight cutout about maybe 18, 24 inches deep. Uh, just about would hold a piece of, of modern plywood. Wow. Well, they did these all over Jerusalem because there's a lot of limestone. It's a, one of the rockiest places in the world for sure. And, uh, they did this all over the city, and they put signs in them to advertise. So that was the first thing he found when he started tunneling down. And when he when he tunneled down so far, he found a, an opening going back into the cliff face, like a cave. It was a vertical shaft that went down to a room. And he got into the room, and there was a crevice uh, indicating that, you know, it led back to the outside of the cliff face and the wall was maybe, I don't know, a foot or two thick at that point, the cliff wall. And he enlarged the crevice and he broke out and he found a big boulder in his way. And on, on the top of that big boulder was a smaller boulder. And underneath that boulder, he found a Roman coin with the Emperor Tiberius's picture on it. Oh, that's incredible. Hey, Dorian, real quick, Dome of the Rock, or uh, Bill said Topas? Topas? Said what? I'm sorry. T-O-P-O-S, and then Greg Weems was asking if you were talking about Dome of the Rock. No, no, the Dome of the Rock sits on this ridge. Uh, Topet, uh, for Bill, for your information, Topet is right under where the uh, uh, the big church, what they call the Church of the Holy Sanctuary, where uh, they claim that Jesus was crucified and buried, which that is not the correct place. Uh, we have the evidence to prove that it's not. But uh, that was Tophet, and Tophet was where they sacrificed the firstborn sons of, of Israel to the to the Molech, to Molech, the, the false god. Uh, it's a very interesting thing if you if you research the history. Uh, major Catholic churches, I mean, the really big ones around the Europe, you will find every one of them is built on a human sacrifice site. Very oh, wow. interesting statistic. So, and that's not something that, the, the, of course, the church fathers would be eager to advertise, but, but you know, you can historically prove it. Anyway, mm -hmm. moving on, um, Mount Moriah. There we go, Mount Moriah. <laughs> Why couldn't I remember that? <laughs> um, you do. Hey, you yeah. know what? You you're you're a little bit older than me, and you do what? Your memory is way better, so don't beat yourself up, Dorian. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate up. that. Okay, so this long ridge was called Mount Moriah. Uh, Golgotha uh, sits right at where they the break where they quarried out this piece, and the reason they quarried this this whole section out was that every time Israel was attacked by its enemies, 
uh, and taken, which was 10 times, they always attacked along the top of Mount Moriah, came right up against the wall, which was 25 feet high, and they would go over at that point. So when they dug this section out, it was a 60-foot cliff and then the 25-foot wall, so that means they had to get up 85 feet and not 25 anymore, and that stopped these attacks from the north. So anyway, that was the reason why the quarry existed. Uh, right on the other side of the big rock that had the Emperor Tiberius' uh, coin under, or on top of it, and you understand that that told us, or that told Ron he was at the Roman level because Tiberius was the emperor at the time of Christ. So it was a very important find, that one little coin. So he began excavating out out around, and he discovered a Roman crucifixion site. It had uh, two two rock shelves. Uh, one was about eight feet above the other, and on the, the lower shelf were carved three cross holes, about 11 inches square and approximately 22 inches deep in the rock, chiseled out with a, a very small chisel. You can you can see you can see the chisel marks, and then in the top shelf there was one central cross hole that was 11 inches square. <clears throat> and about 23, 23, 24 inches deep. And it had a stone cover in it, which tell, which tells you right away that this was a regular execution site, a regular public execution site, and that uh, after each execution, they would put a rock cover on the holes to keep the local kids from filling the holes with debris like kids would do. <clears throat> so this was a major discovery. Uh, while we can't absolutely prove it, we're pretty sure this is where the crucifixion took place. Wow. And what the, what they would do is they would put the, when they did multiple, uh, crucifixions and the Romans didn't do crucifixions, you know, like to torture or anything. They did them to intimidate the, 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 the citizens of, of whatever country they conquered into obedience to Roman law. And we know now why they picked that spot, because 60 feet farther down the cliff, we found what's, what we call a stoning cave. Uh, it was a natural cave. And, and let me say this. The rock of Israel and Jerusalem is absolutely honeycombed with thousands and thousands of caves and passages, uh, some man-made, most of the natural uh, it is an amazing phenomena. It, I believe they have more caves there than we do in the whole United States. I've never seen anything like it. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, there's, there, was, there was cliff faces along the Dead Sea Valley we looked at. You could count 130, 140 caves right in front of your eyes, some of them big enough to drive a semi into. Hmm. Uh, how many caves are sealed and have secrets yet to be discovered? There's got to be hundreds. Uh, Israel is a nation. It's a place of secrets. Well, excuse me. Well, anyway, uh, in the course of the excavation, um, Ron found the ruins. What, what it turns out, we think that after the crucifixion, the site was turned into a first century Christian church. And uh, a very important artifact was found there in front of where the cross holes were that I'll tell you about in just a little while. Keep you in suspenders, as they say, for just a few minutes. <laughs> now, this site is only 80 feet from the garden tomb. The scriptural account says that the tomb was near at hand to the uh, crucifixion site. So that clue fits. You know, again, we're doing history detective work here. And that clue does fit, you know, what the Bible says. This site is very near. Well, anyway, the stoning cave uh, was about 30 feet wide at its mouth, about uh, 9 feet high, and went back in about oh, 15, 20 feet, and where the back of it had been walled up. So apparently the cave went deeper into the Mount Moriah uh, interior, but at one time. And what they would do, we know what it was used for because there were human bones scattered all over the floor and rocks about the size of grapefruits. And Jewish, the Jews or Israelites, uh, they executed by stoning. So this was a, a uh, they had established this as a, a natural, you know, uh, I mean, a public execution site long before the Romans got there. 
And the Romans said, okay, well, this is already a public execution site. We'll just move over here about 60 feet, and we'll put in a crucifixion site, because that's how we execute. Hmm. That makes uh, sense. We think, uh, for, for those of you that are familiar with the story of St. Stephen the Martyr, we think that this cave is where St. Stephen died. Wow. Uh, Golgotha, or this part of Mount Moriah, holds many secrets. Uh, on the opposite side of the mount, from uh, immediately opposite of where the crucifixion site was found, uh, is a little-known secret that the, uh, I'm sure the Israeli government knows it and they don't want it revealed, but that is where the true tomb of David, King David, is. And he's buried in there with 7,000 talents of gold, and the talent was about 40 pounds. Hmm. So we have historical we have historical accounts that, that back that up. Um, you know, I, I don't have time. You know, in this venue to go into every little detail. So what I'm, I'm kind of I'm giving you highlights, and I'm not asking that anybody you know believe everything I say. Uh, but maybe you, some of you will be inspired to continue the research further, and you may end up making some discoveries as well. That's awesome. Well, anyway, one of the things that I wanted to do. And one of the reasons I agreed to come over as a volunteer was uh, the director promised to take us to the ruins of Gomorrah. So I would get a chance to see for myself firsthand what I'd seen in that video. You know, uh, can this, can this be proven? Is this really, uh, Gomorrah, you know, one of the, one of the five cities and did God really destroy them, you know, or did they really, were they really destroyed by a rain of burning sulfur balls? Mm. So, in the middle of the dig, we were there three weeks. So, uh, we just, my wife and I, the way the way it worked, we would start six o'clock in the morning, and we would dig till noon, and then we had to have all signs of our dig covered up, uh, and be out of the garden tomb because they opened for tourists at one o'clock. So all of our digging was done in the morning. Then we had the afternoons free, and so we'd been shopping in the old city, and then we got back to our hotel where everybody was staying. And we got word uh, from somebody that, hey, we're leaving for Gomorrah in five minutes. Well, there had been no announcement or anything, and uh, we barely made the vans that, that went down there. So we got down to these, these ruins, and here's the thing that really, really convinced me. Uh, there was two things. And number one, uh, these ruins were not like any other destroyed cities in all the Middle East. There are hundreds of destroyed cities in the Middle East. Warfare and destruction of cities was a, a way of life for, you know, several thousand years over there. You talk about potential artifacts, Mike. Woo. Right. You know, wow. The, the only problem is you can't dig a hole with a pocket knife without a permit from the Israeli <laughs> Antiquities <laughs> Authority. Right. You know. Mm. So, so here we are. Uh, what's interesting is uh, you can do that in these ruins because these ruins are completely ignored by the Israeli government. But what had happened was that nobody, the, the, the regular archaeologists, still haven't figured out yet. What happened was the sulfur that fell burning was mixed with eight different trace elements. It caused this sulfur to burn at 4,000 degrees, which is, the, for all you ex-military guys, uh, that's the temperature of thermite or thermate, uh, the incendiary that the military likes to use in hand grenades and bombs and stuff. And it will melt metal. Hmm. Uh, so what happened was it's raining down on a city, and please understand something about these cities. They were not all neat little cities made out of stone blocks like Jerusalem is. They were what I call combination cities. They were actually, because there's so many natural caves in the limestone bluffs, a lot of, a lot of those had been carved into houses. You know, the doors had been squared up, windows had been added, and they just moved in. So it was a combination of buildings like the King's Palace that was made out of cut stone, sitting on top of a mesa there or a a plateau, <clears throat> and then there were those uh, structures. There were there were actually hundreds of structures that were carved into the cliff faces themselves. Now, <coughs> excuse me, limestone will burn. Anybody here know limestone will burn? 
I you didn't heard about know that. burning Oh, burning lime I to think get I have. Tip? Yeah, right, right. Okay, limestone catches fire about 2,500 degrees. All right, what happens when it is covered in a rain of burning sulfur balls, and we've seen some that are bigger than grapefruits. We don't know how big the actual biggest ones were. What happens when these things that are like, they're like they were like big globs of molten plastic that's on fire. What happened when they struck these walls? They stuck. Mm. And as they continued to fall and covered these walls, the temperature went up and up and up until suddenly the limestone itself ignited and burned. Wow. There's five sets of ruins where this happened and only five. And so far, nobody else has found any other like them anywhere in the world. Mm. So what happens when you burn limestone in the presence of sulfur? You get uh, uh, limestone is what sodium uh, carbonate. Um, You get you get uh, I think you get calcium, not calcium, calcium sulfide. I think anyway. Okay. um, And you also get uh, gypsum. Um, What you end up with basically is a very very dense ash. That's basically the stuff we make drywall out of. Okay. So what happened is, at the same time, the weather changed. It went from being a very fertile, watered plain, according to the historical records. And then some of these records were written by historians like Josephus. It's not all from the Bible. But it all agrees that this was a very fertile area and that it became a desert. And the the regular rain stopped falling. Like I said, they only get rain there every five to seven years. Uh, you go into those ruins in July, you're going to be dealing with temperatures at 130 degrees or better. It's like it's like Death Valley in the United States. Oh, goodness. Uh, we, we go in the fall, I've uh, been in the ruins five times, and we always went in the fall when it was a comfortable 100 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, on this, first tri- on this first trip to the ruins, here we are, uh, and, and, the, and the director and, and his buddies, they took off and left all this newbies to ourselves. Uh, no instructions, nothing. And we're all wanting to find some of these partially burned sulfur balls to take home that we've seen in the videos. So we're all looking around, and we can smell sulfur in the air, but hmm. we can't find a single sulfur ball. So... And only about 30 minutes, the director and his buddies come out of of this canyon. They walked up, and I guess it was a street at one time, and they're carrying sulfur balls they found. We didn't have any, and he loaded us all up and took us back to Jerusalem, and that was it. Well, I wasn't happy with that. I said, no, I didn't come all the way over here, you know, to get 30 minutes in these incredible ruins and go home with nothing to show for it. (laughs) So... Uh, I found out that a number of the volunteers, because they didn't get any advance notice, had not gotten to go. So what I did was I thought, well, I'm going to rent a seven-passenger van, and then Linda and I are going to go back, and we'll take five other people with us that didn't get to go the first time. And we're going to go back to those ruins, and we're going to find uh, evidence of some of those burned sulfur balls. Well, I went around Jerusalem. I went to Avis. I went to Hertz, all the big you know, American origin uh, car rental places and there was a big deal going on the, the Muslims were having some kind of a big shindig in, in Jerusalem at the time and everybody told me I'm sorry you know we don't have any vehicles for rent they're all rented out now this is where it starts to get a little a little strange folks and I apologize if, if you think you know if you think this is weird and you think I've lost my marbles you'll just have to think that because I'm going to tell you the <laughs> truth I'm going to tell you exactly what happened there was a little Jewish car rental place next to the hotel where we were staying. We were staying at, at the International YMCA Hotel. It's called the Three Arches, if you want to look it up on the net. And it's right across from the King David Hotel where the president and all the important uh, national figures of different countries stay when they come to Israel. Um, so I go next door, practically, to this Eldan car rental. And I talk to a little girl, and, uh, I say little girl, you know, a young lady that comes up to wait on me. And I said, ma'am, I said, I need a seven-passenger van. And she says, I'm sorry, sir, we don't have anything. We're all booked out. And just like everybody else had told me. 
And I'm standing here thinking, what am I going to do now? This was my last hope. And I heard a voice speak clearly in my head that said, ask her to go to the back room and check one more time. I had no idea what the back room was. I'd never been in this place before. So I said, would you mind going to the back room and checking one more time? She looked at me like I'd grown horns and fangs or something. Uh I mean, it was practically shock on her face. And I have no idea why to this day. But she didn't, she didn't say a word. She started walking towards the back of this big long room and there was a door and a wall back there. And I saw desks and people when she opened the door to go in and she came back about a minute later and she said, sir, we do have one seven passenger van left. Wow. And we had our van. We had our van. Well, Hey, I'm getting pretty bold now that I'm saying, and please, I'm just telling you how I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking I just had, I've just had divine intervention here. So I, we get down to the ruins <clears throat> and I, I actually said a little prayer. I said, God, I want you to give me the biggest find of unburned sulfur balls that's ever been made in the history of the study of these ruins. And I actually believed it was going to happen. Huh. Well, the seven of us spread out, and we hunted up and down. Uh, you understand the walls of the city over the years, th- due to the occasional rains, they have shed some of the ash. So all the walls have an ash slope in front of them. It's just loose ash. You can pick it up. It's like almost like talcum powder. And uh, if you were to take a, an excavator and just remove all that loose slopes of ash, everything in, in these canyons and, and and streets that you're in would be vertical. Well, we hadn't found, after two or three hours of hunting, none of us had a single partially burned sulfur ball. And I was getting really disappointed. I was starting to have a little pity party, and I wandered up this hill uh, almost to the top of of this big, long bluff made out of ash, and I had about 12 feet of an ashen wall in front of me and there was the very top of the bluff and I'm standing there and I'm kind of in a bad attitude and I have a geologist hammer in my hand, you know, with a pick on one end. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, well, I asked God to give me a big pint of sulfur balls and he didn't do it. And in frustration, I, I sliced out with that, uh, geologist hammer. And I knocked a big chunk of ash out of that wall right in front of me. And there was about eight or 10 partially burned sulfur balls looking at me. Hmm. We call it, we call it miracle Hill because it turned out, it turned out those sulfur balls were barely out of sight under that ash. And they ran in both directions for hundreds of feet along that ridge. And there were, there were many, many hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, and if you combine the whole range, there was millions of them. Um, Wow. What had happened was we were hunting for sulfur balls where everybody else had, and they had already cleaned them all out, the ones that were easy to find. And that's why we hadn't been finding any. We started uh, seeing them in the, in the cliffs above us, sticking out of the wall, big as golf balls. They were everywhere. And every one of them had a shell around it of partially burned sulfur we had these, we took some of these to a big laboratory in Knoxville, Tennessee, had them analyzed, and they confirmed that these sulfur balls had a shell of burned sulfur around them, that they had once been on fire. Wow. So we found that the Israeli archaeologists were claiming that these ruins were left after the Dead Sea receded over thousands of years. But that would not explain how these sulfur balls were on fire when they fell in these ruins. Right. And the only reason that there was any sulfur balls to find at all in these ruins, and by the way, we've been in the ruins of Adma and uh, Zoar and Gomorrah, I mean, in Sodom. Uh, I have not been in uh, uh, Zeboam. That's the only one of the five cities I haven't been in yet. And the ruins are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. Wow. Um, they, have, they all have the sulfur balls in them. But here was the reason why there were any sulfur balls at all. These sulfur balls are the most incredible things I've ever seen. 
uh, I test burned one the size of a marble in, in, in the bowl of a spoon, a metal spoon I was holding, and it burned a hole right through the spoon. Wow. And the wind changed on me, and the fumes came back in my face, and I got one breath of those, and I went down like somebody had hit me with a two-before. I was on the ground on my back. My lungs were paralyzed. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was going to die. It took me two minutes before I could begin to breathe again. Wow. If I'd had to take, if I had to take another breath, it probably would have killed me. That's how potent the fumes from these things are. And when wow. you, unlike American sulfur, when you find we have cliffs right near where I am here at Appalachian, just less than 15 miles away, that grow sulfur crystals. And this is a, a bright yellow sulfur, and it's grown in hard crystals. And uh, it takes a minute of holding a match to it before it begins to sizzle and bubble and catch fire. When you touch a uh, flame to these sulfur balls in the ruins, they ignite all over instantly, and they burn with a bright purple flame. That's the only color. It's bright wow. purple. Never seen anything like that. Huh. So this is the kind of biblical archaeology you know, that, that I've been involved in, uh, and this is, this is the kind I want to be involved in. Because I don't believe that you have to take the historical accounts of events in the Bible on blind faith. I think you can prove them. I've been to the Red Sea crossing site in Israel, and that's an incredible story in itself. I don't know. Mike, where are we on time? I, I've lost track. We're about an hour and 20 into it. We've got time. And, Dorian, we okay. can always uh, – you know what? You go where you want. Don't feel rushed. We, we can do another show. I, we can pick up part two. So don't uh, leave anything out. Our okay, chat like is our little... chat. Our chat is absolutely dead, and when it's dead, it tells me everybody's listening. So you've got everybody's attention. You go with it however you want. Okay. All right. Uh, the Red Sea Crossing site is an amazing thing. The archaeologists have tried to put it down at the end of the Gulf of Suez arm of the Red Sea. Uh, in an area called the Sea Reeds. And they claimed the water was only 50 feet deep and that the wind blew the water back in one direction, kind of a freak windstorm. You know, now, now imagine this. The wind's strong enough to blow a 15-foot wall of water back in one direction. How are you going to walk through that wind to get to the other side? Right, right. They forgot about that when they made their proclamations. Uh and there's actually, they suggest six different crossing sites. Uh, they're all up there uh, near uh, Egypt proper, you know, the inhabited part of Egypt. They're all up in that area. Uh, and none of them fit the Bible account. The Bible said that, uh, said that the water was a wall on the left and the right. So... Where did the crossing take place? Because they have never found one single archaeological artifact anywhere at any of those six suggested sites on the Gulf of Suez arm of the Red Sea. Our site, at a place called Nueva Beach, is on the Gulf of Aqaba arm of the Red Sea. It's a, it's a finger. If you look at the Red Sea... Imagine somebody holding up their two fingers in the victory sign. You know, all right, the Gulf of Suez uh, arm is on the left. The Gulf of Aqaba arm is on the right. And you follow it up to the end, and it ends at the Israel at the border of Israel. It's the city of Elat. Well, anyway, about halfway up the Gulf of Aqaba is a place called Nueva Beach. And it's the biggest beach and it shows up clearly on the on the satellite maps, even the ones that are taken, you know, way way up there. It just stands out on the whole Gulf of Aqaba. And the importance of it is, we know from the Bible account that there were approximately two million Israelites that came out of Egypt. And the Waba Beach is the only place on the whole Gulf of Aqaba that could hold two million people. So that's good, but we got another problem. We got 
the walls of both sides. And by the way, it's six miles wide there, and Saudi Arabia is immediately on the other side. We have a problem there because the walls are 3,000 feet deep. The, the, I'm How sorry, what, what's 3,000 feet deep? The walls of the Gulf of Aqaba. Okay, okay, okay. You walk into the water and it drops off 3,000 feet. Wow. How do you get 2 million people across that? Bible says they went across dry shod. How could that be possible? Well, it turns out that there was a giant canyon on either side of the crossing site. Uh, it's called the, on the Egyptian side, it's called the Wadi Watir. And that's a very, very interesting name. Uh, these names originated with the Bedouin peoples that inhabit the area. The Bedouins were the wandering peoples in the desert. Mm-hmm. And they don't have a written language. They have an oral tradition. They take uh, young people that show signs of being very skilled and having very great memory capacity, and they teach them tribal history. And they know where all uh, 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 of uh, all these biblical places, they know where they are better than any people over there, better than the Israelis, better than anybody. Wow. Their oral history is much more accurate than written history. So... They call this the Wadi Watir, and it's 17 miles long, vertical sides. Once the Israelites got into it, they couldn't, they had no way out except to go straight ahead until they came out on the Wave of Beach. Now, you got a problem, not only because the water's so deep, but if you go right, the mountains come all the way down to the sea, the beach disappeared, and so you couldn't go right. If you go left, there's a big Egyptian fort that sat right there that was manned, so they couldn't get past the Egyptians to get on, go that way towards Israel. Hmm. Now they've got Pharaoh's army coming up behind them, and they're trapped on the beach. But if you have a canyon on each side, at one time there wasn't a canyon on each side. The canyons were caused by erosion. What came out of these canyons and eroded into the, it's called the Elot Deep, the 3,000 foot ditch filled with water six miles wide, was a combination of limestone, sand, and gravel. Anybody here figure out that that makes concrete? Lime, sand, and gravel makes concrete. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. This material poured into the sea for who knows how many thousands of years from both sides until it met in the middle. It formed a land bridge, better part of a mile wide, all the way across that six miles of that 3,000 foot deep ditch. And it is made out of a natural concrete called conglomerate. So if the water were taken off of it, you wouldn't be walking across on silt or mud. You'd be walking across dry shaw, that is, with dry feet. Hmm. It dips down in the center to where it's eight, 900 feet deep and then gradually starts back up until you come out the other side. Very walkable, very easy. It drops, uh, it drops a foot every 17 and a half feet. Hmm. Foot every, now, that's not bad. Now, all of that is great, and that's pretty amazing that this land bridge would even exist, right? Right. But now imagine it covered with the remains of Pharaoh's army. Chariots, chariot cabs, horse bones, human bones, chariot wheels, all of that stuff. This land bridge is covered with it. Okay. And the pictures exist. Yeah. Go online, do a search, type in Red Sea Crossing Relics. And you should get pictures of the remains of Pharaoh's army. I gotta uh, look at this. Ron Wyatt was the one that discovered it. He and his two sons dived on it. They went down as deep as 200 feet, uh, and they took pictures of the chariot wheels, the remains of the chariots. The chariot axles, in some places, uh, the axles still attached, and, and, and the wheels are sticking straight up. You know, one wheel, uh, the axle sticking straight up. Uh, the problem with the chariot wheels, though, the iron wheels, 
is they attracted coral and they're covered with coral. So, you know, you, when you look at these, you have to look at them a few minutes and then you'll start to see the oh, the wheels and everything. There you are. You, you disappeared so, for uh, a second. Freak scared me a little bit. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. No, we got you and you sound good. You sound good. All righty. That is um, neat. I'm yeah. I'm I'm not seeing pictures yet, but well, I'm seeing like paintings and stuff. But yeah, you can go on my excuse me, my Facebook page, and look at the uh, the pictures. Oh, okay. Um, I have uh, I made several posts over the last year, and I filled with pictures from the Solomon Gomorrah from the Red Sea Crossing site and everything. Yeah, that's something, you know, Dorian, I, I find funny. I just went to your uh, your Facebook page today for the first time. I, I've, I've always just gone to the group page. Um, I was looking for a picture for, of you for the advert. I am, I am finding pictures now, yeah. Um, and uh, I was blown away by all the pictures you have from over there. So, yeah, yeah. and I wanted to mention that tonight. Uh, if you guys want, look up Dorian Cook. Look at all of his pictures. He's got some great pictures from being over uh, uh, doing all this. And these are, these are just, a, I mean, that's just a tiny sampling. I have thousands of pictures taken on our on our digs and stuff over there. Uh, I have pictures of the cross holder on my site. Uh, you can find those where, where the excavation took place. I'm and, sorry, uh, you, what is it? Hang on a second. My apologies. It got dark on me outside. And uh, I had to go and step in the house and turn on a light. <laughs> because uh, we are here in the mountains where they do have some bad snakes. And they like to crawl at night. Right. And you want right. <laughs> to be Absolutely. able to see where you're stepping. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I do have pictures of our excavations there at the Garden Tomb. Pictures of the cross hole, the only pictures taken of it so far, um, of the main cross hole, what we call, um, that we think, you know, at one time held held the cross where Christ was crucified. Oh, wow. But um, what we're finding is there's more and more evidence. Uh, you know, for example, if you were to check, type in a search on Mount Sinai, supposedly where you know, Moses took the Israelites, right? And they all camped out there. Mm-hmm. Well, the Mount Sinai that, that uh, is traditionally the place, it, it's impossible for it to be the place. First thing is, there's not room for two million people to camp. Secondly, not one piece of archaeological evidence has ever been found there to prove that two million people camped there. And all you guys have hunted camps where thousands of soldiers camped. Can you imagine two million people camping in a place for days and days and days, weeks, and not leaving any evidence behind? Right. They had, uh, it said that, you know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, it said they spoiled the Egyptians. They plundered them, and they took jewelry and coins and gold and stuff for wages that they'd never been paid because they were slaves. Mm -hmm. So I'll guarantee you, if you go, you find the camp of the Israelites, and you're going to find... You'll think you died and gone to a good place, as they say. And uh, I know where that camp is, and I'm trying to get our group and our director, our new director, to uh, uh, organize a dig there. Let us go out. Let's let us go out into the desert with melee takers. The problem we're having is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the real Mount Sinai was never in Egypt, as they're trying to put it today. The Bible says it was in Arabia. Well, Arabia is, is today called Saudi Arabia because it was ruled by the House of Saud, but it's still Arabia. It's the same Arabia that's been for thousands of years there. Mm-hmm. And Mount Sinai is a mountain that the Bedouins called Jebel, which is mountain, Jebel Al, A-L, Laws, L-A-W-Z, Jebel Al Laws. What does that mean in the Bedouin language? It means mountain of the law. What happened at Mount Sinai? The law was given, the Ten Commandments. Hmm. Interesting. 
So we have, I mean, there's just so much. We know exactly where Moses' father-in-law Jethro lived. We know the caves. We've got the caves down. i got pictures of the caves where Jethro and, and his family lived in the land of Midian, which is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and what we're discovering is that there are just unbelievable amounts of archaeological evidence that have been preserved that verify biblical accounts. And we're finding in every case, now, okay, I agree. Oh, I look, as a Christian, you can say, well, you're biased. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, that's fine. Anyone's entitled to their opinions. But I know this. I know how I think, and I know that I'm not going to buy into anybody's religion or their doctrines unless I can back them up with some proof. Mm. And I've seen enough proof to be impressed out of my mind uh, with how accurate uh, the counts of the Bible that I've been able to check out. You know, there's many, many events in the Bible, and certainly nobody could check all of them out in a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm hoping maybe some of you that are listening, you know, will take up the torch. Man, I, you know, I would love to be 25 years old right now and know everything that I know. Right. I'd be doing so much biblical work, archaeology and stuff, I would have an absolute ball. I'd do it the rest of my life. <sighs> But, you know, you only get it. You only get so much time. And then then, you know, you have to move on to other things. I'm getting to the point where we're you know, across the big pond travels getting rougher. And uh, I don't have the stamina on the for the digs and, and the heat and all the stuff that I used to. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, but what I can do is try to share some of the things that I did get to experience. Um, I was trying to think of some of the other stuff. Uh, anybody that goes to Israel, let me say this. Yeah. Don't just believe everything those tour guides tell you about what happened where, or this place is where such and such. They've got so many things in the wrong place. Hmm. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the Bible, the Pool of Siloam, uh, they found it, but it was furnished with water by a spring called the Gihon Spring. And they've got the Gihon totally in the wrong place. We know where it is. We found the old maps, found the secret tunnel uh, conduit that was built. Uh, see, this Gihon Springs provided water for the whole city of Israel, and they hid it uh, because it was way outside the city walls. And when they were attacked by the enemy, they didn't want the enemy cutting off their water supply. So they built a secret conduit under the ground uh, called Hezekiah's Conduit. Uh, and, you know, you can walk through what they call Hezekiah's Conduit uh, today. But it's not Hezekiah's conduit. It was built by Pontius Pilate. We, 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 we see very clearly on the old maps the origins of that conduit. We know hmm. where Hezekiah's real conduit is. Wow, and there's cool. uh, so, ma- so many amazing things to see. Uh, underneath almost the – when we say the old city of Jerusalem, we're talking about the city inside the defensive walls. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, when you see those walls, they look very old, very impressive. They were actually only reconstructed about 550 years ago by the Turks when they Mm -hmm. ruled in that area. Uh, They were certainly rebuilt out of the original stones of the walls, and they do follow the original wall lines pretty much. They're off a little bit here and there, but they're fairly accurate, you know, as to how the old city was during the Roman period, you know, which we we call the period of the time that Christ would have walked the earth. Mm. Um, you can go over there, and if you ever do, now how many? Of, well, I, how many? Everybody here has probably heard of the Wailing Wall. Mm-hmm. You know where the Jews went to pray, and they claim that's part of the uh, of the Temple that Mount that wasn't destroyed. And yet, when you see them standing at that wall praying, they are sixty feet above the base of the original wall. And the stones, if you look at the stones. And, and, and listen, folks, there are so many things hidden right in plain sight. If you got your thinking cap on, Jerusalem, uh, King Herod built all of that stuff. You know, he built the second temple and, and the walls, and everything was perfect, and all the stones fit together so closely, you couldn't get a penknife blade between them. Mm-hmm. And they had a two inch recessed border around every stone called the Herodian border. You look at those stones in the Wailing Wall, and you will see broken stones, corners broken off. You will see 
really rough stones with giant grooves and, and things in them, like somebody forgot to finish the face of them. Mm-hmm. Those are stones that were originally from the foundation of the wall. They were never meant to be seen. They were meant to be buried in the dirt. Uh, all they had to do was be flat on top and flat on the, on the ends. And uh, the, the front and back could be really rough. And so they left them rough. And yet you see those stones way up in the wailing wall. See, something's wrong there. Hmm. And like I said, you look at the stones with all the broken corners on them. How do you think those corners got broken? They were thrown down off the Temple Mount by the Roman soldiers. Why did the Roman soldiers, when they destroyed the Second Temple, why did they throw all the stones off the Mount? Well, the inside of the Temple was covered with gold. And Hmm. when they burned it, the gold melted and ran between the cracks of the stones. Even though the cracks were very, very small, gold got in there. And so the Roman soldiers dismantled the whole temple stone by stone, and they threw the debris off of the temple mount to get at that gold that had been in the temple. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, would you like to do a, a, a question and a period there? Would anybody have any questions they'd like me to specifically ask about what we've covered? Uh, yeah, guys, let's, uh, if anybody has any questions, I know Bill, Bill wants to, uh, he asked, uh, that all of your notes be willed to him someday. And I said, get in line me first. <laughs> um, I have, a, I have a question that I, that I've been wanting to ask. How many countries have you, uh, have you, uh, been to? For, for this, for how many uh, countries? Um, well, let's see. I've been to um, eight countries and forty three states in the United States. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. What? What? Uh, you know, one, last... of my, uh, one of my disc- Pardon? No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You you go. One of my discoveries that I'm really proud of, because this fits right in with with the metal detecting uh, treasure hunter in me, um, one of the most interesting places to tour, if you go to Israel, is Caesarea Maritima. Uh, The city of Caesarea uh, was built by, again, built by Herod on the Mediterranean Sea. And this is where the Apostle Paul departed for Rome by the way, for you Bible students, um, they have only excavated 15% of the city. They've got the Colosseum, which is pretty magnificent, excavated other areas. And uh, so when we were there with a group, and everybody wanted to tour the ruins and everything, and I I had already been there one time before, uh, so I left the group in the hands of the guide, and I went walking down the beach. I got out of the way from the tourist area, and I discovered a Roman dump. Anybody here ever dug a dump? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, not not imagine, Roman. A, imagine, not Roman, or, but yeah, I've definitely got into old dumps. Okay. And I think I've got pictures of that on my page, too. But uh, if I don't, I know I'll post them on the, on the group page. And I can repost them, Mike. I can, I can put them up on your page if you want. Love but, that. Uh Folks, Where, imagine you a Roman dump. Imagine finding a Roman dump that has a vertical wall 20 feet high of dirt, Roman relics 2,000 year old stick, sticking out of almost every square foot of it, mm. and it's a mile long. Wow. Mm. I, uh, I was elated, you know, and I thought, okay. And I had uh, one of our guides, we had a very, very knowledgeable guy. This guy was connected with the prime minister and everything else, a war hero and all that, you know. But uh, I asked our guide, and he said, you can surface collect, but you cannot dig without a permit, not even with a pocket knife. Hmm. Okay. So here I'm looking at this wall of Roman relics, pottery, uh, pieces of Roman glass, bottles, uh, I even found what may have been an intact bottle. Roman glass was very thin. And uh, this dump, you know, was burned just like all dumps are. I mean, a lot of dumps are. Uh, I've been in the Cincinnati, downtown Cincinnati dump along the Ohio River from the 1800s. 
it's got layer after layer of burned stuff. Uh, I remember one time pulling a flying eagle quarter right out of the side of the of an eroded gully. Oh wow! Uh, it's dumb. But anyway, um, this dump, you know, it's got all this burned material, and people were the same back then, in, in, at least in the way of losing things, of throwing away clothes with money in them and stuff. And so I'm telling myself, you know, there have to be coins in this dump. And though I can't metal detect, oh, if you could metal detect that vertical wall, uh, I suppose I suppose you could become wealthy in a day, easy. Um, the archaeologists are doing nothing with it. Nothing. Um, they're not even they're ignoring it because mm. it's just too big a project. They don't have the funds. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to search this wall, this section where you know here. I'm going to search this and see if I can't find <clears throat> at least one coin, uh, you know, take home as a souvenir of my discovery. And I had a camera with me, a digital. And so I kept that camera up in front of me and I acted like I was taking pictures with it of the, of the artifacts up close because I didn't know if, uh, you know, this beach was patrolled. Uh, the Israelis were kind of sneaky about that kind of stuff. And sure enough, here came this young guy about maybe 25, 30, uh, wearing street clothes. And he, he, he looks up at me. I'm up above him about 10 feet or so, uh, looking at the cliff face. He says, Hey, what are you doing? I showed him my digital camera. I said, Oh, look at this. I said, this whole wall is full of Roman artifacts. I'm taking pictures with my digital camera. I want to show everybody when I get back home. He, he gave me this kind of disgusted shake of his, of his head. I kind of like, well, you stupid American tourist. <laughs> and then he just walked on down the beach, left me alone. And I thought, got you, buddy. And uh, it was about five minutes later, I found the coin mm. sticking out of, sticking right out of the material. Surface collect, grab it with my fingers, pull it right out. No digging necessary. <laughs> well, I thought, sure. Hey, man, this is a Roman dump. I've got, my, you know, I've got my first found Roman coin because I, I haven't got to go to England and do all that stuff a lot of you guys have yet. You know, I'm, I'm just still on my bucket list. So I'm thinking, okay, I got my first Roman point in Israel. That's something. And then I get looking at it, nice and green, patina and all that, you know, that, like those old bronze coins get. There's something screwy about it. I'm looking at it and thinking, wait a minute. That's not Roman writing on that coin. It was Arabic. Oh. I had a Arabic writing on this coin. It turned out to be a Muslim coin. Our guy had a brother who was in the coin business in Jerusalem, and when we got back to Jerusalem, uh, he called his brother. His brother met us. He looked at the coin, and he told me, this is an Islamic coin. It's about 2,000 years old. Mm. He said, here in Israel, it's worth about 500. He said, in the United States, it's worth 1,500. Hmm. Amazing. So anyway, I thought that was a great souvenir. And uh, for anybody who's wondering how I got it out of the country, well, you know, when you go to the airport, the Israeli security is the toughest in the world. So what I did was, uh, when you <laughs> had a little basket, you put all your change out of your pockets in. Mm -hmm. I just put it in there with the rest of my change. <laughs> Nobody ever even looked. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> That is I mean, funny. there was in plain sight. If there was any, you know, if, if they had any complaints, there was their chance to make them. Wow. Uh, something, uh, you know, I, I don't think we need to get into it tonight, but I know you've done some uh, archaeology, archaeological work and stuff. Um, you know, I'd like to, you know, either, uh, you know, either we could do a show about it if you think you can do no, enough show, but I would love to talk about amateur archaeology and how somebody could get started and stuff. You know, some of these sites that I've hunted, you know, I would like to dig, and I have some ideas how how to do it and stuff. But also, yeah, I'd like to get into that sometime with you. Maybe we can make yeah, a show yeah, out I of that. that. See, that would have been the, the what I paid for the trip over there in two thousand five. That would have been worth uh, just the archaeological experience because I worked, you know, right directly with the archaeologists. I ran the sifting crew. I had nine people under me uh, sifting. We, we excavated 44 tons of material uh, and sifted it through three screens, three different size screens, uh, to get every every coin, every piece of glass, every you know any, anything at all, mm -hmm. uh, every pottery shirt, 
uh, the Israeli archaeologists wanted wanted it all, and uh, it was really funny. Uh, my wife was helping out. Each of the, uh, what they did was they they took water and a brush, a soft brush, and they cleaned the dirt and dust off of the pottery sherds. And uh, the videographer who was who was officially videoing the dig for the white archaeology people walked over, and this young lady that was helping my wife, she's standing there with this. Uh, dishpan in front of her, you know, scrubbing these pottery shirts, and the videographer looks at her and says, what are you doing? She looks at him and smiled real sweetly and says, somebody else's dishes. <laughs> <laughs> How funny is that? <laughs> I thought that was a great, great response. Yeah, that yeah. is great. We're doing uh, somebody else's dishes. It's a fascinating place over there, you know, and uh, sadly, Jerusalem is becoming another big sprawling megalopolis, uh, the last time we were there, uh, the traffic had tripled. Uh, taxi prices had doubled because it takes them longer to get through the traffic now. Mm. But you get out get out of Jerusalem. I mean, there are things in Jerusalem you, you need to see, but you're not going to see them on your regular church tours and things. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, uh, I, I, I've told people, you know, I would really like, like to have been able to take people over on a secret of, of of Jerusalem tour and just take them down under the ground places. I know where to go and show them things that would blow their minds. You know, there's just so, so much incredible history there. You go down 60 feet and actually I saw three levels of houses, stone houses. Uh, here's a stone house with a square doorway and a window. And it's got four feet of rubble on top of it, stone rubble. And then there's another house almost exactly like it. And it's got four feet of stone rubble on top of it, and then an, another house on top of that one with rubble on top of it, showing all the different destructions of Jerusalem. Mm. That is so Amazing cool. sight. Mm-hmm. That, that is just, uh, again, we've just, you've left me speechless. I mean, I, you, you tell a story so good I can get visuals in my head and stuff, and I'm just kind of... Uh, I uh, just love having you on Dorian and, and we just get so many compliments. Uh, so many people are so excited that you keep coming back on and talking. Well, I, 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 I have to say, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm really surprised about all of that. I didn't expect that kind of response. Uh, I, you've had a very, very gracious audience. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful very much. So, um, uh, I, uh, I love to share this information. You know, it, it was exciting to me. Yeah, I think you can tell by the way I talk and explain it. I'm still excited about it. Absolutely. What, um, what, what, what has impressed you the most, or what have you seen over there that got your attention the most on your travels over there, over overseas, let's say? You mean in Israel? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you talked about it just from, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, boy. Well, you have to understand, as a Christian, to be able to put my hands in that hole that that very possibly held Jesus Christ on that cross. Mm. That was probably the most emotional experience for me. I, I just literally had. I like electric shock, cold chills running up and down my back. Mm. Uh, I, you know, just a natural reaction, I guess. Yeah. As far as, uh, you know, as far as something, though, that was so incredibly impressive, was standing in the ruins of Gomorrah on those ashes and just unbidden, it came to my mind the scripture that says, and the uh, and the wicked shall be ashes under the feet of the righteous. Mm. And I thought, I thought, wow, you know, if you walk through the ruins of Gomorrah or Sodom, you are standing on the ashes of people who died there. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you will see in the pictures if you go and look at the pictures that I've got on on my my, my page. And, and Mike, if you want, you know, any of these posted on on your page, I'll be glad to do it. You can see. You can still see the entrances into these houses and the windows and things. A lot of them have shape. They're not safe to go into uh, without, you know, it has to be a very professionally archaeological type deal. Mm-hmm. And I asked our guide, who was so highly connected. I'll tell you how highly connected he was. 
uh, he had won awards for the best guy in Israel, but he actually called the prime minister of Israel on his cell phone right in front of me and talked to him right in, right in front of me. Hmm. So, you know, I, I knew this guy had some connections, and I asked him, I said, would you explain, please explain to me why doesn't Israel acknowledge these ruins and advertise them, bring millions of tourists to come and see what we're seeing? I said, you believe these are the ruins, don't you? He says, oh, yes, absolutely. I said, then why doesn't, why doesn't the Israeli government, I said, this is Old Testament. Well, you know, they shouldn't have any problem acknowledging the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, well, he says, you don't understand our government. I said, what do you mean? He said, we have a number of people in our Congress, they call it the Knesset, okay. who have an alternative lifestyle. And he said, they're not comfortable with these ruins existing, and so officially they don't. Uh, I'm just telling you what I was told. Interesting. You know, I'm not passing judgment. I'm just telling you what the man told me. Hmm. So the bottom line is that leaves, I mean, Gomorrah is right at the base of Masada, uh, which is a very famous uh, fort that Herod built on top of the mountain uh, where the Romans took them two years to capture that fort. And the 1,200 Jews committed suicide rather than to be taken prisoner by the Romans. Mm-hmm. So, uh, very famous place. When you're up on up there on top, looking down, <clears throat> you're looking at the city of Gomorrah, uh, Gamora, and it was a city that probably uh, held a hundred to two hundred thousand people. It was a bigger city than, than we wow. ever met. Wow. We have hesitated to go into the ruins of Sodom because there's a different geological situation there, and a number of people exploring the ruins and walking around on top of the bluffs, the ash. Remember that everything's made out of this ash. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you can walk up to what looks like a rock wall and you can punch it with your fist and your fist will go right into it. It won't hurt you. Hmm. Uh, but what's happened in Gomorrah, apparently a number of people just disappeared because they got up there and, you know, there were, there were caves and structures underneath them they didn't know about, and the roof just collapsed, and they were buried under many tons of this ash. Oh, wow. Wow. I bet that was and, a little uh, bit. My, understand, my understanding is that, that nobody who's disappeared there has been found. Their body's never been found. Hmm. So we wow. decided uh, we'd stay out of there. Uh, we walked around on the bluffs of the moor and stuff. And, uh, <coughs> that's... As far as I know, nobody nobody has been killed in the war. Hmm. Uh, much safer. But, excuse me, pardon me, we got <clears throat> a pollen situation here. Uh, I'm talking a little bit in my throat. Uh, the thing about Gamora uh, is that when you find the entrances into these houses, the doorways and the windows and stuff, it's not safe to go in because, number one, the danger collapsed. If the roof came down on you, you'd be buried. Right. And number two, you can run into black, 10-foot-long black desert cobras inside hmm. of these structures. Hmm. I've got a picture of three or four of them all tangled together up on a ledge in one of these caves. Hmm. And uh, number three, some of these caves... Uh, or uh, former structures are homes for hyenas, wild hyenas. Oh, wow. So, yeah. did, did, <laughs> you know, this is in Kansas, Toto. <laughs> right. Did you run into anything other than the snakes? I'm sorry? Did you run into anything other than the snakes? No. The cobras? No. Mm-hmm. Jeez, I bet that's that was that. Yeah, I see. See, I was all ready to pack up and and go and and this is. But you just mentioned cobras, and I'm out. I'm out, Dory, and I just uh, snakes. <laughs> well, if snakes. it's any consolation to you, the black cobra is not particularly aggressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what they always say. I don't know if you've heard that, <laughs> but uh, they always say, "Oh, that snake ain't aggressive." No, it's not aggressive. <laughs> Well, when well, you, you get know, to... actually, they have they have one over there called the saw scale viper. It's like a rattlesnake without rattles, mm-hmm. and that that dude will get up in a bush and he will launch himself out of that bush for as far as twenty feet and catch a bird right in mid flight. Oh, and the saw scale viper is all over Asia and the Middle East, 
and it, it is responsible for 6,000 deaths a year. Mm. So that's the one I don't want to run into. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what though, supposedly there aren't any, uh, regular cobras in Israel. Okay. And the first trip over there in 84, I broke away from the tour group at, at the, at the ruins of, of a place called Beth Shemesh. And when you hear, when you see the prefix of Beth in Israel, that means in Hebrew, it means city. Bethlehem. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget what the Lahem means now. City of something. Uh, anyway, um, I'm walking around the ruins of Beth Shemesh and weeds about waist high. Mm-hmm. And I'm listening pieces of, of buildings and fireplaces sticking out of the ground, getting all excited. This is my first trip over there. You know, thinking, I'm thinking archaeology finds, artifacts. And I'm having a ball, and suddenly I, I jump back because right in front of me is a nine-foot-long olive drab-looking snake. Mm. Thankfully for me, its head had been blown off by the guy who was on the tour bus before we got there. Oh, wow. Mm. And it was a king cobra. Oh, jeez. Mm. Here I am walking around in waist high weeds. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, mm. well, uh, thankfully, uh, all I got was a bad scare. But I'll guarantee you, I never got myself into that situation again. <laughs> yeah, no, no thanks. Um, on your On your trips over... Did you, um, was there anything that, that you felt like, uh, I had, I had another question for you. Now I'm trying to think of how I was going to, going to ask it. Was there anything that, that seemed out of place? You know, we talked about out of place archeology span last week. Um, did anything seem out of place or strike you funny or, or, uh, I mean, I know we've already touched on that some, but I mean, was there any artifacts or anything that. Well, I guess one of the uh, things I saw that reminded me of other places that I've read about and watched on YouTube videos and things, when I went down in what's called the uh, Rabbi's Tunnel or the Western Tunnel, which is right next to the Wailing Wall, you pay like five shekels, which is, at the time, was like, I don't know, two or three U.S. dollars, Mm. and, and you go down. 60 feet below the ground, you get down to the very base of the, of the wall, the original wall of the Temple Mount. And it, it was not destroyed. The stones are still there. They're still perfect. They're beautiful. But there's one stone, I think it's eight feet high off the ground, and it weighs 128 tons. Ooh. And you have to ask yourself, how did they do this now? That might impress you, but wait till I get done with the rest of the story. Below the old city, covering about two-thirds of the area inside the walls, is a cave, a giant cave called Zedekiah's Cave. It was also called Solomon's Quarries because all that stone for the first temple was quarried there in this cave. Uh, I have been in this cave. I've explored it from one end to the other. We found a, uh, a secret tunnel entrance that had been lost for a couple thousand years. Um, I say we, myself, and the uh, oldest son of the, the director were exploring together and uh, reported to the Israeli archaeologists. They got really excited. They didn't know it was there. Mm. And... Uh, we think it was it was an escape tunnel that was used by King Zedekiah in the Bible when the, when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. Uh, but anyway, that's not a story. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the scripture says that when the first temple was built, not a tool was heard on a stone. Well, how do you do that? I mean, how do you build this giant temple, you know, on the on the Temple Mount, and you don't have any hammers and chisels going? Hmm. Well, it's simple. All that work went on down below the ground. So now you have all these giant stones, and and stones 20 tons or more were pretty common, and they all had to be lifted up about 50 or 60 feet through the ceiling of the cave. 
to get them up to ground level. Mm. And then they, they could cart them over to the Temple Mount. Well, so that sounds these impossible. Guys, these, these guys knew they had, you know, uh, call it primitive if you want, but they had technology that allowed them to do this. Do we know what that technology was? We really don't, because nobody is making a concentrated study on it that I'm aware of. Okay. You know, Dorian, you're going to think I'm 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 a little bit crazy here. I'm sure. Um, I I get a kick out of the show Ancient Aliens, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, but a lot of it, a lot of it, I just totally dismiss. It's more of entertaining, but there are things that come up that make me wonder. But it even makes me wonder more about how how we think these people were uh primitive and i i just I, I have to believe that they aren't near they weren't nearly as primitive as we think but i i so what's been lost to history you know what were they doing what you know um there's been uh people that say like the pyramids were were giant batteries and something i, I mean I find it hard to believe that 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 kind of, and I understand it was slave slavery, but I find it hard to believe that much manpower went in to build just a tomb. You know, well, I, let me I, uh, let me share let me share a story with you real quick mm-hmm. about the Great Pyramid, and you know I have no way uh, of proving this. Uh, except it fits into a certain pattern of other research I've done. So I'm not going to try to sell you that this is absolutely true, but I want to try to sell you on the idea of how it would tie into out-of-place archaeology or advanced ancient technology, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, during World War II, an Egyptian boy saw a team of Nazis uh, had archaeologists with them prying a stone out of the base of the Great Pyramid and accessing a tunnel behind that stone Hmm. that obviously nobody knew was there. So the teenage boy went to the British authorities because this was being done secretly at night he went to the British authorities and reported it, and they sent a commando team to surround the entrance, and they were waiting in ambush for the Nazis when they came out. Mm-hmm. And the Nazis were reported to be carrying a black sarcophagus, black polished, maybe marble, you know, some stone, uh, very highly polished. It didn't have sharp corners. It was rounded on all four corners. It wasn't very big. It was about uh, four feet long, uh, maybe 18, 20 inches wide, and uh, four feet long width, and about uh, about 18, 20 inches high. Mm Mm-hmm. And so they captured uh, they captured the whole group without having to shoot anybody. Um, and the British discovered inside this black sarcophagus when they opened it, supposedly, an atomic bomb. Hmm. And the sarcophagus had been taken out of of the Great Pyramid, uh, where the opening was. The tunnel went down under the pyramid. Uh, This is a story that has persisted, and supposedly, the rest of the story goes that the British, not having a nuclear weapon development program, sent the bomb, gave it to the United States. It was sent to Los Alamos, New Mexico, and that was the first atomic bomb test that was done by the U.S., was Mm. that bomb they found in the sarcophagus. Hmm. And supposedly that's how we got the atomic bomb. Interesting. I, I a neat know, story, doesn't it? It sure does. Let me, I, I, we're kind of running late here. 
but I do want to kind of tell this story. Um, you know, and, and I don't know how this goes with your religious beliefs and stuff, but I'm going to relay it through a friend, let's say somebody who was confirmed to be really high up. Uh, actually, I, I don't think, an let's say a federal employee, um, okay. that it's a known fact through, through a friend that this person worked in, in a facility that was off limits to everybody. You know, you had retina scan, you couldn't take anything in. And that person was asked by my friend, is there such thing as aliens? And wouldn't go into detail and said, yes. Um, I, I want to tell another quick story. Um, and I don't know if I've shared this with you off, off air, but a long time ago, doing work for a guy, he had retired from a, a military base. Um, we did work for several weeks. He he would tell us just great stories, just a great guy, really enjoyed it. One of our last days there, it was, it was asked, um, you know, is there, is there aliens? And it was really asked as a joke and without a smile or anything, he said, yes. And it really shocked us. Um, it just really surprised us. What little we knew about him from our talks, he, he didn't seem like the type of person to tell stories or anything. Now, who knows? But, you know, so that does intrigue me when you talk, you know, I, I mean, I highly suspect either one of two things. There was some kind of outside um, help or the ancient world was much more sophisticated than we think. I, I mean, you know, my biggest thing is how do these cultures all over the world share certain things? You know, like the pyramids and the designs of some of these pyramids that are found in South America yeah. and Egypt and stuff. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, the technology, uh, I, I believe you you and I talked about this one time off of air, off air, but I, I know I've, I've heard about it over in um, India supposedly an ain't you know they believe that there was a, an atomic bomb set off you know in ancient times and there's supposedly right. proof of that i mean uh, either right. there was some kind of intervention or there was there was uh you know they were much more sophisticated than right. most give them what's your thoughts on that well of course moses uh who wrote the story of Noah and the flood. Uh, and Noah lived a long time after the flood, according to the scriptures. And um, I'm not sure exactly how Moses got his information, but what he said was that the reason why the flood, you know, came to destroy mankind was that the earth was full of violence. You know, and I think we tend to, get a mental image when we read that of, oh, yeah, you know, these guys had sticks and clubs and bows and were shooting each other with arrows, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really know what uh, level of uh, technology that they had before this great flood. I mean, there's tons of evidence uh, for this flood, and one of them, you know, I suppose they took <laughs> millions of years to form the Grand Canyon, but actually, the Grand Canyon was formed by the runoff from the flood. It was formed very, very quickly. Hmm. And uh, there was just a huge amount, a lot of canyons, and, and you know, the land was changed by the incredible amount of water that, that uh, was involved in this deluge. And the deluge marks are everywhere. Uh, I went to the ruins of ancient Jericho in Israel. You know, Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling mm -hmm. down. And I actually saw where they had cut through the city walls, and you could see, indeed, that the stones of the walls had fallen outward, just like the Bible account said. And yet, that's the only conquered city, destroyed city, in the whole Middle East where they've ever found the walls having fallen outward instead of inward. Hmm. What's that mean? So, you know, even that fits the Bible account. Uh, 
but anyway, they had excavated down and they actually showed, uh, you could see where the level of that glacier flood, uh, you could see, uh, excuse me, the old ruins of Jericho. Jericho has been, it's probably the oldest, one of the oldest cities on earth. It had been destroyed seven times. Hmm. And one of the times it was destroyed, it was destroyed by the flood. And there was mixed with the debris of a city, that level that the archaeologists had excavated down were seashells and things that were not found below it or above it. Hmm. Interesting. You know, so it was like stuff that was carried in. You know, right, and again, right. It's, and that's just one small example. There's, there's actually thousands of examples of, uh, all around the world proving that at one time the earth was covered by, uh, you know, a deluge of water. In change seas, continents, all kinds of stuff. Um, but we don't know. And, and I have recently, and this is just, you know, I jokingly say this is the gospel according to Dorian because this is all this is is my speculation. <laughs> right. But based on a lifetime of being involved in stuff like this, I'm wondering, you know, Noah was 120 years, according to the Bible record, building this ark. Hmm. And you have to ask yourself, the world is filled with violence, and Noah starts building this big, giant boat on land, something they've never seen before. If they were advanced way beyond the technology that he used in building that boat, then they would not see his boat as any kind of a threat to them. You know, they say, well, that, that's just crazy old Noah. Let him build his old boat. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's just speculation. Uh, but I'm thinking, you know, if the whole world was filled with violence, and you know, if they bypassed Noah, you know, he, he apparently had 120 years to, to work on that boat, and nobody attacked his boat or set it on fire or anything like that or even tried to, apparently. At least there's no record of it. And uh, mm. that's a very interesting uh, situation. But I do personally believe that the pre-flood world was far advanced and the world before that one was even more advanced. Mm -hmm. Now I could just see people who are students of the Bible say, Whoa, 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 wait a minute here. What are you talking about? What do you mean the world before that one? Well, if you get right into the very first verses of the Bible in Genesis one, it says, and the world became void and without form and that's the English translation, the choice of the King James translators. But the Hebrew says tohu and bohu, which means chaos and confusion. The world became chaotic and confused. So if it became chaotic and confused before the creation, it wasn't chaotic and confused at one time. So it existed, it was not chaotic, it was not confused, and then it became that way. Well, what caused it to become that way? We have no details in the Bible, no record in, in history. Right. Hmm. It, you know, it'd be just like you, you know, somebody taking you over here to the desert and showing you the ruins of, of a city and saying this city was destroyed, you know, by a nuclear bomb, you know, back in, in 1945. And uh, it, and it's telling you nothing more. You don't know why the city was destroyed. You don't know what the war was all about. You don't know, right. uh, you know, did all the people died? And, you know, did, did any of them survive? Where did they go? You don't have any information. You don't know. Mm-hmm. Only the archaeological record can provide information. But you have to get some uh, brave archaeologist who gets that theory and says, I'm going to prove that there was an organized world society and maybe people on the earth before the creation. Mm-hmm. You know, that the creation was actually a recreation. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. But what we know is that, that the world was apparently in decent order. And if it was a world, was it a world only inhabited by animal life? Was that when the dinosaurs were running around? You know, they found, I mean, right there near you, Mike, right there in Dinosaur Valley, they found human tracks alongside dinosaur tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you told me that. Yep. How interesting is that? 
Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing is, I mean, it, it poses a great deal of mysteries uh, to keep people that have minds uh, that are made to do that kind of thing, to keep them occupied, <laughs> give yeah. them something to do. You know? Right. Uh, you know, it's fun to chase mysteries, fun to solve them. Uh, mm-hmm. I've solved a few. I've got a lot more unsolved than I do solve, but uh, there's always a feeling of accomplishment when you, you manage to solve something that has been lost to history. You know, there's a Absolutely. particular set of Civil War artifacts that have been lost to history, and I think I've figured out where they are. I'm going to try to try to recover them, and if I do, I'll make some Civil War history. But uh, it, it took me it took me a lot of years to track them down. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, you'll work on projects when you're 25, 30, 35, and you can be a real smart fellow or gal, and you can make some progress, but you don't. You can't quite put it together. <laughs> And you go on down the path of life, and you get older, and you do other projects, you know, and you get more experience. And then one day, you'll pick up your notes or something on that project you haven't looked at for 10 or 15 years. And suddenly, well, with crystal clarity, you'll see what you were missing. You'll see the one thing that was keeping you from success. Yeah. I, you know, even at early 40s, I look back at, at things and and you know i think that's also along the lines i think as when you're younger some things you can't handle or you can't you're not your knowledge isn't there you're not uh, mature enough then with age that comes and isn't it funny when your body starts to change and you slow down that's when a lot of the secrets are revealed <laughs> sadly <laughs> yeah, that's it seems to be the case. <laughs> right, right. You Dorian, know, we really need to does. we need to make that trip this fall. We need to make a plan and stick to it. Steph has her job now. Um money's not such a concern anymore. We need to we need to seriously look at that and do that this fall. I think now it's getting too hot. I think by the time we planned it it would be too hot. Um but I think we should. I think we should. Well, Mike, the clock's ticking on me. I'm 71. I don't know how many more months or years of uh, of field work I'll be able to handle. So, you know, I'm not excited about when people tell me to put off a project six months anymore. Back in my 40s or 50s, no problem. Well, don't you you think it's too hot now to to plan something like that? I mean, we're... Where we're talking about, I mean, that's, the, you know, for the one trip we talked about, that is, that's going to be hot. I mean, we're already well, getting up we into the... Well, if it was going to take us three weeks in the desert or something, sure, I understand. You know, we're not going to go out in the Arizona desert or anything like that. You know, but this is, <clears throat> this is something where, um, you know, a half day or a few hours at a time, and then you can come out and take a break and drive into town, cool off, and then come back to it. Uh, so let's let's talk about it then. I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah. What about this? What about the snakes? Uh, snakes you have with you always. You you get you a good set of snake guards. And but I'll tell you this, Mike. I have oh my! I've got eight thousand hours on metal detectors, and six thousand hours are in some of the snakiest places you've ever seen. Deep mm-hmm. woods, you know, swamps. Uh, I would have felt a lot better by snake. I would have, I would have felt a lot better if you'd have said, "Oh, Mike, there's no snake. We're not going to run into snakes. We're not." No, oh. you're just. Saying, <laughs> that's what I was. Yeah, hoping well, for. you know, you know, Mike, I, I have this, I have this crippling handicap. Mm-hmm. I, I have this compulsive need to tell the truth. Mm. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> thing to have. I, I'm afraid I we'll see I'm, a snake. I'm out of style these days because. Well, I know all these people that try to get me to buy their products don't feel any need to tell the truth. <laughs> right, right. My my biggest concern is you seeing me poop myself, scream like a girl. Uh, it would be embarrassing if we run across a snake. I, I'm telling you, they just. I, I'm not. It hey, sounds like great blackmail. Sounds like great blackmail material. Yeah, I'm down. I'm I'm all for it. I, I'm uh <laughs> Uh, you know what? You tell me when when you're thinking, and I I'll make the trip. I'll make it happen. I want to do it. Um, you know, Bill says I see snakes all the time. Respect them and keep an eye on them. Move on. That's what they do. 
Bill, I agree. I'm not even s- s- scared to Where see Bill one. Where's Bill located? Bill's in uh, southern Ohio. He's in um, Zanesville area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Probably not yeah. too far from you. A couple hours, I'm sure. But uh, I wonder if you've got anybody listening from Texas that's ever encountered an indigo snake. <sighs> Why'd you have to bring up Texas? What's an indigo? <laughs> Oh, it's it's the most beautiful snake in the world. It's metallic, bright metallic purple. Really? Uh, And I mean brilliant purple. Uh, Sometimes it reflects blue tints, purple tints. And uh, it's a small snake. It only grows to 15 foot long, Mike. Oh, that's it? That's it? (laughs) Does it really? No. Yes, it does. Uh, I saw saw an eight or nine footer down at Fort Park in Texas. Uh, sunning itself out in one of the old military roads there. Oh, we were no. But yeah, I respect it's a friendly them. snake. Yeah. I don't it's try to kill snake, them Mike, or anything. But... I, you know, I, I, I don't try to kill them. I don't. I just, yeah. my, biggest, my biggest concern is not even seeing one off in a distance. They blend so well. I'm afraid of stepping on one or getting too close to one. That's my fear. You know, um, it's not even this seeing what you wear the snake guards, Mike. Yeah. Just in case you miss one. Mm-hmm. I've is... never been struck, but I did walk by uh, down Jenkins Ferry, Arkansas, to War Battlefield. I was wearing, uh, I wore lineman boots for snake boots back in those days. They came up to my knees, laced up. And uh, I walked by a mud puddle in the old logging road that we'd walk in on. And there was a copperhead laying concealed in the muddy water with just its head sticking above the water. And I walked by within six inches of that head, but it did not strike me. Oh, Here's goodness. the thing. If it had, I would not have been hurt. It could not have penetrated my boots. Mm-hmm. But uh, like you said, it might have it might have caused me to need a change of uh, hmm, clothing. Right, but, uh, <laughs> right. I, I was talking to a guy in... Louisiana. I used to talk to him metal detecting. He had a friend that was coming down out of his tree stand. When he stepped down, a rattlesnake bit him. It didn't penetrate. He had on snake boots and stuff, but it hit him so hard it bruised him. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he said he, he couldn't believe it. It hit it. It struck him so hard. Struck those boots so hard it it it, it left a bruise. But uh. Dorian, if you a big one. if you want to talk about going like real soon, and and uh, I just thought it'd be better in the fall. Let's do it. If if you if I can, if you're willing to do that trip, I'm willing to do it. You let me know when's a good time. Let me pick out a little bit of, you know, give me a little bit of wiggle room so I can work it out with Steph, and let's see what we can do. Well, the old guys will tell you, Mike, that you know, don't depend on us being around necessarily tomorrow next year because, you know, once you're past, you get past 65, uh, you start to get a sense of your mortality. You know, you know you're running out of time and that you're going to go the way of all flesh. And so mm-hmm. you don't want to postpone like you like you could do back in the, your younger days because you felt like you still had all this time ahead of you. Mm-hmm. And it's not so much, you know, I'm 71. I could live to be 94 could I do it in good health? See, would, would my health be, would my knees hold up? Would my back hold up? You know, would I be able to go out and walk several miles through the woods if I had to, to reach an objective? Right. Those are the things that you start to consider that you never even had a thought for when you were younger. Right. Right. Um, yeah, no, I get that. Absolutely. Dorian, let's end the show. We're two and a half hours in, um, you have melted my brain. You've given me so much to to think about, and uh, sure. uh, oh, I love. I, I, I absolutely. You just your best speaker I've ever I've ever heard. I just love every show, and uh, again, hope we hope we can keep 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 getting you come back, and uh, we'll talk. You know, we'll talk in the next few days. We always do, and maybe we can come up with something else or where you want to go next okay. with it. Um, I would really enjoy that. Dorian, again, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, absolutely. I enjoyed it. And, 
uh, wish you and your and your group the best there, Mike. Thank uh, you so I much. wish I I wish I had the time to be more um, active in your group, <laughs> but I found if I were just a member of my group, I could do both. Mm-hmm. But I've got so many projects, and the guys you know are wanting more stories out of me and stuff, and it takes time. Even if I take a chapter out of one of my books and put it on the group page. You know, I have to convert that over to the Facebook format before the post. Dorian, no, no and, apologies. Uh, um, if people want to see more of you, they they need to come join the group. It's that simple. Um, I get it. I, I you know I'm busy, and sometimes it's days before I'm on. I come on and uh, I, I do my thing, and and you know I, what I usually do is I'll have some time and I'll come look through all the past stuff I hadn't seen and comment and stuff. So no, no, no worries. Um, again, if you guys want to, want to see more of Dorian, hear more of his stories. Um, we dig the civil war dash headquarters, a great place to be. It's, it's really, it's become my favorite place to be on social media and Facebook. So, uh, absolutely. So, uh, all right, Dorian. I'm, we're going to get off here. I'm my voice is starting Alrighty. to go and everything else. But thank you so much once again. It's been great. People in the room are saying have him back and uh, awesome show. Got to keep him coming back. Um, Steve said wow. at 71, you have more doctors than friends. I thought that was funny, but actually, Dorian doesn't. <laughs> uh, it's, tell, him, tell him I don't. Yeah, uh, I'm Dorian a, I'm does. My own doctor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a funny, st- uh, real quick, just a quick funny story. I-, I called Dorian one day, and I could just hear all this rustling going on, and uh, he's just carrying on a conversation normal. But it sounded like like there was, and I forget you were picking up leaves or or um, stuff, but you'd been been at it a while because I heard it for a while. And at seventy one, he wasn't breathing hard or anything else. But he was—you were picking up branches, or I don't recall exactly what you were doing. I know you were doing yard work, and I thought, boy, I sure hope it's seventy one. I, you know, I can I can go pick up branches and still carry a conversation. And uh, uh, I, okay, one more thing: we were doing a show, um, me and Matt, Matt and I, and um, in the background, I'm I'm talking to our guest, and I hear. You know this breathing, and I'm like, "What the heck is Matt doing? What is going on?" Like it, it, it. it you know, I hate to say this, but it, it sounded, it didn't sound right. You know, it didn't. Uh, <laughs> and and we get off the phone, or we get off the the we we finish the show, and I call him up. And I'm like, "What was that?" And he's like, "I was picking uh, weeds out of my." out of my driveway and I thought I had my phone on mute, but, uh, yeah, it just, it, I'm trying to finish up the show and talk to our guest and I hear, <sighs> <sighs> I'm like, Oh goodness, Matt. Oh goodness. I think that's a good story to end the show on. What about you? That's, yeah, that's a extreme case of multitasking, right? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Right, everybody, thank oh, you so much. Bid everybody good night. I sure will. Good night, Dorian. Look forward to next time. Absolutely. Soon. Soon. Bye-bye. Good night, Good night sir. Boy, I love having Dorian. He he does. He he talks about so much stuff, so such cool stuff. Like by the end, my, my mind's just gone. I'm still trying to process so much. I, I hope you enjoy having him on as much as I do. I know I, I've had a lot of people reach out and, uh, you know, that, you know, I, I just, in praise of, of him and, and having him on. So, and, and I just really enjoy it. And I hope you do too. Uh, like to give a shout out to some of our, uh, friends, uh, on Facebook, we dig the civil war headquarters, zero discrimination. She's on, she's got a Facebook group. She's got a Facebook page. And of course her YouTube channel, girls rock metal detecting, same thing. She's got YouTube and, um, She's got a YouTube channel and um, a Facebook group, Dirt Pirates Detecting. 
And I guess that's it. <laughs> he just wears me out. Absolutely wears me out. Good night, everybody. Hope you had, I hope you enjoyed the show.